All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, so today, just doing uh, my live for Friday, July 28th. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, everyone, for watching um, the recording. Hopefully, this answers a lot of people's questions and uh, it helps people get on the right track. So as usual, if people can just put question and then colon and then ask their question, that helps me see the questions and uh and, and know uh what you know you know separate those out from just just the chat in there i have a first super chat from janine hanks thank you so much i really appreciate that it doesn't come with a question um if you meant to put a question in there just write question and and put that out there and i will try and catch that as well thank you very much for that all right so looks like we've got um a number of people joining already. Hopefully more people will come in as well and have questions. So hello, everyone. And uh, if you could tell me where everyone's coming from, it's always interesting to see every, every, you know, everybody and where they're coming from and everything like that. And if you have questions, do pop them out there. I was going to say that I did a recent interview well discussion with my friend Richard Smith Smith who goes by keto pro has a channel on YouTube and Instagram by that name keto dash pro very smart guy professional well former professional bodybuilder natural competitor won the European uh pro bodybuilding championship as a natural competitor uh going up against unnatural competitors uh so that's, that's quite impressive and uh so he knows a lot about uh physiology and biology and biochemistry and has done a lot of work in in that field as well and we went through and spoke about the idea that long-term ketosis is maybe not a good idea this this sort of stems from the work of ray pete and uh, uh georgie dinkoff is um uh sort of uh, you know uh, been on different podcasts and discussed with different people and, you know, presented the evidence on why he thinks that it might not be a good idea raising cortisol and things like that, that can, that can be harmful long-term. So, uh, Richard and I just, just discussed those points and, uh, raised our counterpoints. And uh, I think that there are quite a lot of them. And I think that if you also just, just look at what happens, like with me, I've been in on a ketogenic diet, which is what a carnivore diet is. If you're only eating meat, I've been doing that for nearly six years again this time and five years previously and felt amazing doing it then, still feel amazing. And my cortisol is not through the roof. And there's a lot of uh, studies actually showing long term uh, people in ketosis, you know, 24 months plus that uh, don't raise their cortisol. And uh, more importantly, they all seem to lower and ameliorate the symptoms and signs of high cortisol. So even if their cortisol comes up a bit, this, you know, the, all the sort of things that you would associate with high cortisol, it doesn't get crazy high ever. But if it, uh, even if it does come up a little bit, which can be normal, it could be your body wants to be a little higher and wants to get back to physiological because people with metabolic syndrome, in fact, suppress their cortisol. And so a carnivore keto diet can actually fix metabolic syndrome. And so of course your cortisol is going to come up a bit. There are other studies that show that you can get a, a bit of a rise in cortisol as well, but generally it's not that much. Quite often it's not at all. And in every case that I could find, it ameliorates the signs and symptoms of high cortisol right? So that means that whatever your number is doing, physiologically, you're improving from a cortisol standpoint. And in fact, doctors who know about this, uh, endocrinologists and so on, will actually put people with primary hypercortisolism, uh, you know, who have some sort of tumor or some other sort of reason for, for a massive amount of cortisol, will put them on a ketogenic diet, before and after the surgical or medical management for that hyper secretion of, of cortisol. So it, uh, it, it's, so it's not just 
you know, just one way or the other. And there are, there are other people that are, that are now saying, well, maybe, you know, being in, in ketosis for a long term is not a good idea. I think of this in, in respects of just our normal physio physiology and biology. We've been doing this for a very long time. Um, during the ice ages, there weren't really carbohydrates available that we, that we know of. I don't know what carbohydrates people were eating when they were in the Arctic circle in an ice age crossing the land bridge from Asia to North America. I don't, I don't think anything is going to grow up there. Right. So certainly no, no, no fruit or honey or anything like that is going to get up there. And, and so you can't live generation after generation after generation after generation. If, if being in constant state of, uh, well, you're not going to be in ketosis every second of every day, even on a, just a meat-based diet. However, whatever you're doing, it's supposed to be doing that, right? So you can't survive generation after generation if you need carbohydrates. And that's something that's generally accepted by many uh, medical boards, institutes of science and things like that, that uh, recognize that, no, there, there's no such thing as, a, as an essential carbohydrate. And, um, you know, so if there you know, if we had to be on carbohydrates at some point, couldn't just eat meat long term, well, then of course there would be uh, essential carbohydrates. You would have to eat carbohydrates. That would be something that you would have to do. So, you know, so just a few of those. But we actually go in, go into quite a lot of detail in the studies. Also, uh, Georgie and I actually uh, had a, a friendly debate on uh, Brian Grin's podcast, G R Y N, and uh, and that was great. He's a very nice guy, and he's very uh, very sincere, and, he, and he's he's very bright, and um, you know, and he and he brings a lot of you know facts and evidence. Talks a lot of, about different studies, and and uh, I thought we had a great conversation. There's a lot of crossover. I, I think we we agreed on most things, and there's just a couple fine points that we you know we just had sort of a different take on things. And, uh, and that's fine. That's really important to do that and to have those discussions and to be able to talk like that uh, rationally and reasonably with people. There are some people you try to talk to and uh, and they're just, you know, dickheads. <laughs> you can't, there's no talking to them. And uh, and they're just trying to, you know, make a, make a fuss and a name for themselves uh, online. And it's just like, well, there's, there's no point in talking to those people. But uh, George is not one of those. He's, he's actually a very nice guy and, and, uh, and I think very sincere in his approach. And so uh, I encourage people to go see that. So that debate is out now uh, on the Brian Grin podcast and uh, and his YouTube channel. I have sort of uh, posts and links about that in my uh, Instagram. And uh, so I encourage people to go check that out and you can see the back and forth the, and the points that we each raised to each other and how we both responded. And then uh, uh, Richard and I will be posting our video of basically a response to Georgie on uh, Dr. Mercola's podcast, where I actually convinced Dr. Mercola to, to stop doing keto, uh, which is pretty impressive. You know I mean? Obviously he's, he's bringing uh, some, some heat, you know, if he's, if he's convincing a lot of people to, to stop doing keto full time, um, which is, uh, which is great. You know, he's, he's bringing he's bringing a strong, counterpoint. So we bring a counter to that counterpoint and you guys can check that out and see what you think and make a decision for yourselves. So let me just see if I can find something from Janine, just to make sure that I'm not missing anything from her. And I can't see anything anyway. Um, Here's a question as we go uh, from Let's Go. It's like, have you experienced in your life oxalate dumping? I have not experienced oxalate dumping myself. I have come across a few people that you know may uh, have been experiencing oxalate dumping. A lot of people will have will have different sorts of issues. Um, uh, will have different sorts of issues. That you know, may be related to oxalates, may be related to oxalate dumping, but you can you can often you know try to try to troubleshoot the issues and get people actually just eating meat and water. Make sure they're eating enough fat. Make sure they're getting enough water. Make sure they're actually eating to satiety, not eating a bunch of artificial sweeteners and other sorts of things that could be you know confusing the issue. Um, 
because you know that those are all things that need to be addressed as well you know oxide dumping is is ex i mean you can't really prove it there's not like really a good blood test or anything like that that you can do and show that that you're oxalate dumping or something like that it's very difficult and so it sort of is a is a diagnosis of exclusion meaning that once you sort of work through all the other possibilities and and you can't find anything else you say okay well you know this this fits that pattern right and uh, i've seen that a couple times and um uh, but a lot of times you can you can you can troubleshoot the issues i personally have never experienced anything like that um for my for myself but uh you know it's not to say that they have it you know if you watch my my interview with sally norton you know she definitely experienced that she had a, a horrible time with it and she has had a number of people that she's helped over the years who have definitely had that and and has been able to to help um with her sort of protocol of a very very low oxalate uh intake on top of like a carnivore diet and um and she's essentially carnivore um apparently she said that she's she's all, all the way carnivore except that she has a bit of carbs at night because otherwise she she can't sleep there's something that uh, is holding her back from being able to go to sleep unless she has a bit of bit of carbs at night and so you know i've heard that a couple times some people have problems sleeping um i i think that uh you know it would be good for people to try you know other things and uh, and see if they can sort of work through it but uh you know but for her that's 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 what she she wants to do but otherwise she's she's really just eating meat and um and she's helped a lot of people with that so if that's what you think you're experiencing i would look at that video with sally norton look up her uh other videos and, and information and resources she has a book called toxic superfoods which is great and and uh, but also remember to troubleshoot all the other things make sure you're only eating fatty meat and water get down to just red meat and water if you can and you know, on, on top of that, make sure that you're hey, eating enough, eating enough fat, getting enough water and not eating anything else. So if you're, if you don't have that baseline yet, if you haven't gone 100% just fatty meat and water, then you don't, you don't really have anything to, to, to judge it against. Right. So you, there could be other things that you're including that are giving you these, these different weird side effects. So that's what I would do. Okay, so here's a question from Janine who gave uh, the super chat earlier. So uh, thank you very much for that previous super chat. And question is, hi, 56-year-old female, um, CD two years, so carnivore die two years, Stanton migrate, migraine P version, um, IR tofu. Don't know exactly what that, that is referring to. One coffee a day uh, is only vice exercise check. CCS zero blood pressure issues started ACE inhibitors concern regarding uh, sodium potassium balance and migraine uh, would like a consult. Okay. Um, well, I think that um, migraines uh, can be very responsive to a ketogenic diet of any, any form such as carnivore. And you're just, you're just eliminating things that aren't supposed to be in your body and allowing your brain to work properly and, and run on ketones and things like that. Um, coffee can be a bit of a, of a, of a flying the ointment because uh, caffeine, if you withdraw from caffeine, that will give you headaches. Um, uh, but also you can get a bit dehydrated drinking coffee, one coffee a day, probably not all that much, but do make sure that you're getting enough water because water is, is a very big trigger or dehydration is a very big trigger even mild dehydration is a very big trigger for uh headaches migraines and so on if you're concerned about your your sodium and potassium balance um you should you should get that checked um i, I would wonder you know why you're concerned about that if that's just a general concern or if you're having specific symptoms that that would make you concerned about that sodium getting too low you get very confused then you get seizures and then you die. It's a very, very serious thing. It's not just, oh, I get some cramps or, or something like that. It's, it's very serious. And with potassium being too low or too high, you get arrhythmias, you get massively elevated heart rate, and then you get further arrhythmias and then you die, right? So very, very serious as well. These are extraordinarily rare 
to get actually out of the, the range of normality. And this is one of the reference ranges uh, in lab tests that, that is actually is actually accurate. You know, it's, it's not like, ah, well, you know, it could be a bit off. You know, generally, you know, you, you do want to be within the range that they, that they say for potassium and, and uh, sodium. So um, blood pressure issues, that's a quite rare on a carnivore diet. Um, coffee can increase blood pressure, especially like pressed coffee, not filtered coffee. So espressos and different sorts of things that are just boiled. Uh, there are things called these rancid, uh, rancid oils and things like that that come with coffee that uh, are known to elevate the blood pressure. So like cold brew coffee and filtered coffee usually get that stuff out um, or don't bring it in the first place. That's what cold brew does. And so you can try that or you can just try getting rid of the coffee. Um, I'm really trying to figure out what IR tofu means. Um, hopefully you're not eating tofu because that would be gross, but I don't think, I don't think it would necessarily cause, cause the issues you're having. Um, you know, starting to have blood pressure issues on a carnivore diet, I've never seen that before. So I would wonder if there's, if there's something else going on. And, um, and, uh, yeah, I think potentially Janine, I, I think I remember getting an email from, you know, the people at low carb, down under um that maybe you were sort of asking about this and and if so i will be responding to that email uh later and we can we can discuss that further so hopefully hopefully uh we, we can figure that out but um you know hopefully the the rest of that that sort of answer uh was able to to help you in in, in some ways as well if you're again if you're concerned about sodium and potassium you need to get it checked most people won't have an issue, especially two years on a carnivore diet. You shouldn't be getting electrolyte disturbances at, at this point. Coffee can strip your body of magnesium, right? And so you might be lower on magnesium and also dehydrate you, which is not what you want. So something to think about there. Okay, so I'll do this question and then I'll, I'll start getting to the super chats because they're, they're rolling in. A uh, question from Bob's Pistols and Pater. Question. Hello, Dr. Chafee. My Sancha has diverticulitis, is overweight, and in her 40s. What would you recommend for her diet? Thanks in advance. Uh, same thing as, as everyone else. You know, anything that any sort of medical issues or any sort of you know genetic issues or what have you doesn't change our fundamental biological design and biological needs. So we are all still human doesn't matter if we have this gene or that gene or whatever, we're all still human. And so we still have, uh, you know, an optimal human diet, you know, as, uh, as Dr. Barry says, so we, we are still going to require the same things. We're going to require all the things that come in fatty meat. And uh, we don't want to eat all these other things that can cause harm. All, you know, albeit some of these things call, you know, can cause minor harm. You know, maybe you don't notice it too much, but over time, you know, this stuff can build up. And so that's why I just personally just don't want, don't want any of it in my body at, at, at any time. And you don't need it anyway. And so for diverticulitis, um, diverticulitis is an infection of diverticulosis, which is the outpouching of the distal colon. That has been shown in a, a large study with over 2,000 people on colonoscopy, shown that that, um, that that is associated with actually higher fiber intake and more bowel motions a week. So namely more than 15 bowel motions a week. So on average, two or more, slightly more than two bowel motions a day. So two a day, you know, plus one on Saturday sort of thing. And that has been associated with a higher risk of developing diverticulosis, which can then precipitate diverticulitis, which is an infection. Um, meat is, you know, nearly 100% bioavailable and you, and you absorb it and it's nearly 0% residue, right? So when, when you have diverticulitis, you have a flare up of diverticulitis or appendicitis or any sort of other bowel issues, you get put on a low residue diet. What does that mean? It means low residue coming out. So 
food that you absorb most of. So very little of it comes out, namely no fiber at all, right? So fiber is so good for us. Why do we, as a mainstay in medicine, get people the hell away from fiber whenever there's a problem with your bowel? Doesn't really make too, too much sense. And then, you know, we get them through their, that acute presentation and they go, oh, got to get to start eating fiber. Oh my God, get on that fiber. Uh, no, how about you don't? How about you just eat what your body can absorb and utilize? Uh, that's going to be much better for you. So I would still suggest the same thing. Um, you know, weight is going to improve, obviously, from, from being on a proper diet and uh, being healthy. You're just going to feel better in general um, and you'll be able to exercise as well. You don't need to exercise to lose weight, but uh, it doesn't hurt and it, and it certainly helps your health a lot. So especially uh, you know, um, anaerobic activities, so weightlifting and sprinting, those, those exercises are the best exercises you can do for your health and longevity and cardiovascular health. So cardio is misnamed. It's actually weightlifting and sprinting should be called cardio. So hopefully that helps. All right, I'm gonna get start getting to some of these super chats, guys. Uh, so I apologize if I if I miss other people's questions, but um, it does help pop up when obviously there's a, a super chat and I can see it. Uh, not to say you have to do a super chat, uh, but you know I I, I do prioritize these. Um, because uh, you need to. Um, thank you very much, Adam, for the super chat. He says, uh, carnivore, uh, one meal a day, had half a pound hamburger, five eggs, and butter. Is it enough for a six foot four, 268 pound male? I stop when taste diminishes. Um, that's not too much. You know, I, um, you know, I'm six three, you know, 235 at the moment around there. And, uh, I eat probably around two pounds of ribeye a day, give or take. Right. And if I'm working out and I'm working out more, which I'm finally getting back into sort of working out regularly, like just, just this week, um, you know, I, I would eat more. I could, I could easily double that if I'm, if I'm regularly hitting the gym. Um, so it just depends. So you, you want to eat until it stops tasting good entirely. So not just diminishes, but just you don't want to eat anymore. So you don't have to get to the point where you're forcing yourself to eat it. But if you get to the point where you just sort of go like, oh, it's, it's, it's okay, it's all right. And you get to a point where you're like, hmm, I'm not, hmm, I'm not just not really interested in it anymore. That's that's the, sort of the stop point. But if it's just not, not tasting as amazing and you're sort of feeling very satiated, which you will, um, you know, that's not, you're not quite there, right? So or try eating a bit more. Also, you have to think about the fact that, you know, if you have excess body fat at 6'4", 268, you, you may well, unless you're very, very muscular and, and um, uh, which I'm sure you're going to have a lot of muscle, but you could also have excess adiposity, so excess fat tissue. And if you do, your body's going to prioritize that fat. You're just going to use that fat as well. And uh, as your normal energy sources, and it's going to, in addition to the food that you're eating. And so it could very well be that that's exactly how much your body wants. And uh, so just see. So if, if your taste is sort of diminishing, okay, maybe keep eating. But if it's getting to a point where you're like, I don't want to put another bite in my mouth, you you can safely stop there, even if it's you know only half a pound and, and of beef and, and five eggs. That's totally fine. Uh, another question from Adam. Thank you again for that. Um, is five day gap between bowel movements normal on uh, one meal a day carnival? Yeah, that's actually that can be quite typical. So people are different. Some people still, you know, go to the bathroom every day. Usually they're the ones drinking coffee or tea because that's a bit of a laxative. It's actually a lot of a laxative, and so you can get more more often. Uh, go to the bathroom more often. But yeah, I, you know, five day gap is perfectly normal. I've seen people sort of do two weeks, but still have soft stools. That just means that's just a demonstration of the fact that you're absorbing the majority of the food that you're eating. Now, if you're, you know, five days in between, so, so it's not, it's about consistency in constipation, not frequency. So just because there's a five day gap 
or a two week gap. That does not mean you're constipated. It's the consistency of the stools. And so if the consistency of the stools is dry and hard and rocky and pebbly, that's constipation, right? And so that means you're not eating enough fat. And so that can cause, you know, you know, pain and GI upset and, and, uh, it could eventually become, you know, more severe and get, you know, uh, blocked up and, you know, need laxatives and things like that to, to get you, get you free and clear. But, uh, that's from not eating enough fat and like really, really eating way too little fat because it's that excess fat. Your body has a limited capacity to absorb fat. And after that is sort of a spillover effect and, and you can't absorb fat anymore. And once you, you've done that, that excess fat gets into the stools and then, you know, you don't have, you don't have uh, hard dry stools because there's, there's fat in there that move it through. So that's what you want to do. If you're still getting just soft, normal consistency stools, perfect. You're getting enough fat and it doesn't matter if it's five days or two weeks. If uh, it's dry and hard, you need more, you need more fat. That's constipation. Um, so super chat from MPN 527. There was no, uh, question attached. Thank you very much for the super chat. If, um, if there was supposed to be a question attached with that, you know, please, you know, you know, write question and, um, and, uh, put that up and, and I'll hopefully be able to see it. Sometimes it's hard to see in, uh, in with the rest of the, the chats. However, if you do that, I will look for it. So, okay. Question from God's secret agent. <laughs> Thank you for the super chat. Uh, lime and pandas. I'm assuming you're not keeping pandas. That's probably something else. A brain autoimmune disease related to strep. Okay, not one I've come across before. Been lion diet with a few exceptions for two months. Uh, sleep interruptions and nocturia have worsened. So that's nighttime urination. I'm not often hungry and think I'm eating enough. Oh, so, okay. Well, I, I, autoimmune issues in general will improve once you eliminate out all these other things, which your body tends to react to and, and create auto anti well, antibodies towards that can have a cross reaction with your own uh, surface antigens. And so you eliminate those out those antibodies will come down and you'll have less damage to your body and your body will be able to heal. And so that that's generally what, what I see and what, what people see in general with autoimmune issues. So I have not seen this particular autoimmune issue and carnivore and how they, how they line up, but just on the basic principle of how autoimmunity seems to behave and it seems to be related to environmental triggers through our diet and others, but a lot of it has to do with our diet that, you know, I would be, you know, very optimistic that it, that it will help you as well. Two months is early days, you know? So, you know, just, I would just keep going and I would, I would do just red meat and water. Autoimmune pe sufferers in particular really need to be very strict and re really need to be just really red meat and water, uh, grass fed and finished if you can, but not everybody needs that. Just the ruminant animal uh, tissue is just much safer. So avoid things like pork, chicken, even fish, especially farmed fish. Stay far away from that. Everyone should stay far away from farmed fish, uh, but eggs and dairy as well. And I would just, I would really just try just you know, beef, lamb, goat, venison, moose, if you can get it, it's delicious. Moose is the best tasting animal I've ever had in my life. Um, that would oh, just love that stuff. So that that's what I would do. Lyme disease takes a long time to heal and no guarantees that, that it will if you have chronic Lyme, but there are people going back to the 1800s that have gone on a pure red meat and water diet and cured their chronic Lyme disease that they've suffered with for you know, over a decade, kept them bedridden, and then like literally bedridden for a decade. And then after nine months of just eating beef and water, um, there's one lady who wrote, wrote a book on this when she came across Dr. Salisbury's book. And uh, after nine months, she was able to, to actually walk down to the butcher into town and get her own meat and come back and grind it herself. Whereas for the last 12 years or something like that, she'd been in bed. She could not get out of bed. 
that's amazing. And then another sort of four or five months after that, she was basically back to normal. So I would, uh, I would be optimistic, but also patient. You know, this is something that will take a long time, you know, and, uh, and it takes, it takes a while to heal. It's not going to be overnight. Sleep interruptions in nocturia have worsened. Generally nocturia is going to have to do with, uh, how close before bedtime you're drinking water. There's one thing I saw, uh, with uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman, where he talked, where he spoke about how it's actually the the rate of uh, of drinking water before bed that actually has more to do with whether it's going to wake you up. So if you're just sort of sipping on the same amount of water over a period of time um, before bed, that you you won't have as much need to go uh, and urinate at night. Whereas if you just slam, you know, two liters of water before you go to bed or the same amount of water. So I would just try to, I would try to do that or just, you know, uh, stop drinking water a few hours before you go to bed and, uh, you know, and try to pee before you go to bed. Sleep interruptions, you know, you want to be able to uh, optimize your sleep, get a sleep mask, go to bed at the same time every night, turn off lights an hour before you're going to be asleep, get morning sun exposure, get the light in your eyes, get outside, all those sorts of things, set up your circadian rhythm to have you actually sleep better at night. And so, you know, if you're getting that morning exposure, you're getting outside, you're, you know, doing cold exposure, just turning on the shower, you know, cold for 30 seconds to two minutes and, uh, and just waking up your body, that sets you up for better sleep at night and going to sleep at the same time consistently, obviously, you know, having nocturia, having to get up to pee, that's going to interrupt your sleep as well. So, you know, fixing that, getting a sleep mask, fixing all those other little things and your sleep should get better and better. You'll have better uh, energy throughout the day uh, and feel, feel better as a result of that. So, so that's, that's what I would do. And, uh, and hopefully that, uh, that helps see here. Okay. Okay. So uh, super chat from Chris in real life. Thank you very much for that. Uh, question started carnivore 13 days ago, dropped eight pounds in the first three days. Great. Then suddenly gained six back. <laughs> okay. Uh, do I just stick with it? I have PCOS, um, IR and Lyme's disease and uh need to lose uh 50 pounds more uh yeah i would i would definitely just stick with it you know if you if you put weight back on there are reasons for that you could be uh, having you know dairy or artificial sweeteners and that can make you go the other way that's a very common stall and even reversal is uh, too much dairy or any artificial sweeteners you don't want to do that you can actually you can actually get a uh an insulin response um uh, from, from eating artificial sweeteners, you know, you're, you're triggering your body to make insulin and say, Hey, you know, what's going on. Then you're not getting the, the blood sugar in your body's like, mm, what the hell's going on? And it can actually cause you to overeat and, uh, and do other things as well. So that, I mean, there are mixed, you know, mixed reviews in the studies, but that's always the case because most of the studies are done by industry and the people trying to sell you, uh, these artificial sweeteners or sugar and all these other sorts of things. So, um, you know, I, I, I go by the ones that, that are independently, funded, run and operated. And those do seem to have, have a bit of an issue. So I would get rid of all of that. But if you're only doing meat, only doing water, then I would definitely stick with it. Remember also that, you know, if you're working out, you're going to be putting on muscle and you're going to offset the fat that you're losing. You know, I lost a significant amount of weight just by dropping vegetables. You know, I was already not eating carbs. And then I just ate a lot more meat and stopped eating the vegetables. I lost 23 pounds in 10 days. And then I didn't lose any weight for months and months and months and months and months. And that's because I was replacing the fat I was losing with muscle that I was gaining. So just remember that as well. Um, and then, yeah. And then uh, just making sure that you're eating enough as well, making sure that you're eating enough fatty meat, getting enough fat, but getting enough food in general, that's going to signal to your body that you're in a time of abundance, you have plenty of resources and you don't need to sequester your, your nutrients in your fat stores and lower your metabolism, which is what can happen, right? So if you're, if you're under eating, you're trying to diet, this is not a diet. This is a way of life this is a way of eating and allowing your body to, to just work normally. Then you're, you know, if you're, if you're 
chronically reducing the amount of meat that you're eating or food that you're eating, you're going to trigger your body that you're in a famine that you need to survive and that you need to you need to sequester these nutrients. So I would not do that. I would eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. Drink enough water, uh, exercise as much as you can get out and walk, lift weights if you are able to, and, you know, and, and just keep going from there. Right. And, uh, you know, especially with things like PCOS and Lyme disease, another IR there. I'm trying to figure out what people mean by that. I should probably know that, but anyway, uh, it's, spell things out, guys. I, I, I don't know every acronym. Um, I should probably know most of them, but uh, for some reason, I'm not. Uh, I'm just blanking on, on what people mean by IR at the moment. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, you have these issues. You know, th those do take time to heal, and it's very important to be eating properly for that. The weight loss will happen as well, but but don't focus that as the mainstay of what you're doing. Focus on your health, how you're feeling, your energy levels and the improvements. Always, always, always keep track of the improvements, right? Because if you're just looking at weight and you're just looking at the scale, right? Which is not about the scale, it's about body composition, right? So losing fat, putting on muscle, putting on bone density, right? So scale is not very helpful in the first place, right? I didn't lose any weight after that initial loss, right? So I could be looking at going like, my God, this doesn't work. But I could see in the mirror that I was changing rapidly. And I didn't care about that anyway. I never cared about my weight. I cared about my health. I cared about my performance. And 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 very distant down that list was my physique. I never really, you know, cared too much what I looked like. You know, I'd just get in shape for rugby and I would, you know, my my appearance would would change accordingly. But I never I never worked out in order to have a physique. I worked out to get healthy and to be able to perform athletically. So, you know, my priorities were very different. And so I didn't get hung up on things. I'm not seeing the improvements that I want in this specific narrow window. And so I, I don't get, you know, discouraged and dissuaded. So that's what we should do here as well. Okay. Just, yes, you want to lose weight. You want to do all these things, focus on your health. That's the most important thing, right? How are you feeling? How's your energy? How are you doing? The rest of it will come. Okay. Weight loss will happen fat loss will happen, but you do need to be patient with that and focus on the things that are most important, which, which are your health. The rest will come, you know, just make sure you're doing all those, all those things that I spoke about doing all the right things, giving your body exactly what it needs and, and you'll be fine. Okay. So super chat from Robono. Thank you very much from that question. Still looking uh, for that wonderful sleep have been animal products, 95% just beef and butter since June 1st. What could be my problem? Life is rather stressful right now. I'm very sorry to hear that stress of course can be a trigger and a factor. Uh, there are some people, you know, like I mentioned with Sally Norton, she just feels it like a bit of carbs at night, help her go to sleep. And I think that's probably to do with the fact that you raise your insulin a bit that drops your blood sugar, suppresses your ketones. And then your brain doesn't have as much energy and you just naturally get drowsy. And like, if I have a glass of milk, like I will get very drowsy, you know, after, you know, half hour, an hour or something like that, um, which I don't want. So, you know, but some people might use that to help them go to sleep. I, I don't feel that that's in my best interest or, or what I need to do. And so I, I don't do that, but you need to optimize your sleep. Otherwise, you know, like I was saying before, turn off the lights an hour before you want to be asleep, get a sleep mask, get out in the, in the sun in the morning and, um, you know, do all the things that you can do to optimize your body's, uh, sleep schedule. Um, you can take low dose of melatonin again, one hour before you go want to be asleep with the lights off. Melatonin only works if the lights are off. So if you've got all these lights on and things like that, you know, then, then you're not, then you're going to suppress your melatonin. You're not going to sleep as well. And, uh, and if you get up in the middle of the night and you, you know, turn on the bathroom light to go pee or something like that, that will take out all the melatonin in your brain. And just having that little light on your phone as it's charging, that's enough to disturb your sleep. So this is why a sleep mask is a good idea as well. You know, you want to basically be in, in a, in a deep, dark cave and, uh, and sleep with absolutely no light. Uh, that that can be better, you know, dealing with your stress and, and trying to get into a less stressed state can also help with sleep. 
Sometimes when we're stressed, we go to other vices and crutches, such as coffee. That's going to disrupt your sleep. Any amount of caffeine, even just first thing in the morning, is going to screw up your sleep. Always. You know, if I, if you know, the, the few times that I've, I've, I think twice I've had coffee, you know, in, in the last several years, um, in the morning, first thing in the morning, I, it's two in the morning. I'm just like wired and I just, I can't sleep and I, and, and, and it sucks. And then I'm, I'm up at, you know, four the next day. And this is like, this is not, this is not a good idea. So, you know, any amount of caffeine is going to, is going to screw you up. So that's what I would do is just try to optimize your sleep schedule. Try to t- try to reduce stress, just some mindful breathing and some meditation. This actually really helps stress. And you're doing something that you that you can just decompress and just get away from that stress. That can help as well. Uh, good luck with that. I'm very sorry to hear that. Uh, super chat from John Delaney. Thank you very much for that. If I have gallstones, will I not be able to do gall- uh, carnivore? No, not at all. So you know, again, in any sort of medical issue, you're still human, right? And so as a human, you can eat what humans are supposed to eat. Now, gallstones really come from not eating enough fat for a long time. And you can have different sorts of physiological reasons why someone will be predisposed to making stones. However, if you're eating enough fat, meaning that you're eating as much fat as you have made bile for every single day, there will be no bile in your gallbladder for which to turn into a stone, right? So you can't get stones, right? Even if you were someone who were going to turn bile into a a bile stone in one day, if you're eating enough fat every day, can't happen. Now, no one is going to be turning bile into a stone in one day or else you'd be dead in in utero, right? You would, you would, you, you, you'd be a miscarriage, right? Uh, Because you, you would have gotten that blockage and died a long time ago, right? So, you know, that's not, uh, that's not something you have to worry about, but you know, gallstones, you know, I think physiologically just, you know, I don't have studies to show this, but, uh, just understanding the anatomy and physiology, you make bile goes into your gallbladder and then it sits there until you eat fat and then it expresses out. Right. And it sits there and it will concentrate. And that's something that people don't understand is that it doesn't just spill over. It gets full up and then Everything else just goes away. No, it actually concentrates. And physiologically, it can concentrate up to 20 times more uh, than, than you know the initial you know, secretion from your liver. Now, there may be people that, that get more than that. Maybe those are the ones that get gallstones, whereas other people who eat a low-fat diet chronically don't. You know, So there's something else going on there as well. But it all co- comes down to you know, the fact that this is sitting in your gallbladder for longer than it should, right? And so what happens to any hyper-concentrated solution at rest? Anyone who's taking chemistry will understand that you start getting precipitate. You start making little crystals, right? You start making stones, right? So that's what bile sludge is, is a precipitate. That's what stones are, is the crystals, right? And they'll grow and they'll grow and they'll grow and that, as, as they do. So if you already have gallstones, there are a lot of people that have had, you know, gallstone issues and pains and what have you, and go on a carnivore diet, a high-fat carnivore diet, problem's gone. Now, if you have a stone that's big enough that now it's starting to be pushed out and it gets stuck, you're going to need help getting that out, right? But that's, I mean, that, that's a ticking time bomb anyway. You're, you're going to eventually get that. Uh, have, have that be a problem at some point down the road. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, the horse is out of the barn and, uh, you know, closing the door doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't help. But, you know, if the stones are small enough and you start eating fat, it's just, they're, they're going to pass through that can happen. Um, but a lot of people do this with gallstones and are perfectly fine, but you, you do have a risk no matter what you do, no matter what you eat, you are at a risk now of having one of those gallstones get caught. You know, the earlier you start eating more fat, A, you're just going to get it over with, or B, you're going to get at it while they're still small enough that they can actually pass through. But eventually, you know, with gallstones, this is going to be a problem at some point, no matter what you do. Um, And so I still would recommend uh, just eating what we're biologically designed to eat. And, uh, but be aware that you could have a problem. You could have a problem anyway, but, uh, that is something you should be, should be aware of. Okay. Hope that helps. 
So MPN uh, 527, so that was our, our super chat from before that didn't have a question. Thank you for, for showing that again. Uh, question, have a friend who is a great singer but is battling muscle tension dysphonia. Interesting. Would carnivore help him to get back to his livelihood? That's a good question. Um, you know, it does depend on what is, is causing the the dysphonia and, and what is causing that issue in the first place. If that's food related and it's something that's triggering, then yes, then then doing eliminating out those things and just eating what we're supposed to eat could help that. Uh, there are so many things that that we are just seeing people people improve their health on that that you know obviously means that it's the food that they're eating that is causing problems. People, you know, go to this for weight loss or for muscle aches or joint aches or or lupus or something like that, and then they have all these other things that helps me. Like you know, you know my glass pres glasses prescription got better. You know, crazy things like that 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 uh you know that they weren't expecting they didn't even know were really a problem and then all of a sudden start improving so they don't even notice that it was an issue until it went away right so it could very well be that this is related to the food that they're eating and uh and that will improve i can't say for sure i i don't know that's not something that i've seen before you know things like lupus or crohn's i can say yes that's going to help him that's helped everyone that i've seen uh, get on uh, who has gone on a strict red meat and water diet. Every single person with with those autoimmune issues that I've seen has has improved. Um, but you know that specific issue with muscle tension dysphonia, I haven't I haven't you know seen anyone else <laughs> who has that. It's uh, it's rare enough that um, that it doesn't it doesn't come up that much. However, it's well worth a shot, and it's going to help him in a thousand other ways and improve his health anyway. And you never know, you know, it's going to reduce inflammation 100%. So if there's an inflammatory response and, and that's sort of screwing with his, his vocal cords, that'll help. Um, and it will improve things in other ways as well. So it could very well help. But even if it doesn't, it, it will help him in a lot of other ways. So I think it's it's well worth it. But unfortunately, I, I just I, I can't tell you for sure if that'll help with that. Cindy Van Cam, thank you very much for the super chat. Question, esophagus not pushing food into stomach over 50% of the time and um, put on a meprazole due to uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. How do I manage on carnivore? Interesting. So yeah, having, you know, having uh, so, you know, generally it's like a neurological disorder that, you know, that, that our, our esophagus isn't peristalsing properly sometimes you'll have like a little out pouching which is uh rare but it happens and um uh and that, and that can be a problem too it doesn't sound like that's what you have that sounds like you know, peristalsis may be a problem um a meprazole due to gerd um that often just heals once you get get rid of a, a lot of the different sorts of uh you know, plants and carbs and things like that and your, your body starts making a more normal amount of acid and uh more to the point it will will uh protect the stomach better as well so that most people actually actually get better uh from their gastroesophageal reflux disease on a carnivore diet uh, I wouldn't just come off the omeprazole right away. I would I would do this for a while, make sure that you're you're feeling good and not having any symptoms you know, for like a month, and then uh, if you're feeling confident, then you can try coming off of that. But I wouldn't I wouldn't just jump off of that right away. Um, with this, the esophagus not pushing food into the stomach, I mean that's going to be you know an issue regardless of what you eat, right? Um, you know, so I, I don't know if, you know, drinking water that helps push things down and, and can flood things down or uh, if you have to do sort of other things. But but basically the same thing that you would do for anything else that you would eat, you know, whatever, however else you manage that, you just do that with meat. And, you know, it should be should be sort of the same. Now, you know, if, if it is a sort of a neurological dysfunction, you know, could that improve? Potentially, there are a number of different neurological issues that do improve. On a carnivore diet which again you know it's just something that we're just seeing a lot of different things that people are improving on just by eliminating out a lot of things that aren't good for them and you know a lot of things that are also potentially giving you your body a lot of things that it needs all the b12 and um and uh fat and cholesterol and things like that that are very important for your our neurological health and our nervous system 
So that could help, but you know, either way, you're going to have that same problem with anything that you eat. So you might as well just eat meat that has the highest nutrient density. So you're going to get most bang for your buck and, uh, and that can actually help your, your GERD as well. So I hope that helps. Russell Sheridan, thank you very much for the super chat. I've gotten addicted to salami. Yeah, it's the uh, salami's good. Uh, zero grams of carbs, but obviously it has uh, many spices. As, uh, you know, more spices as more as much spices as bacon. Sorry, on the ingredients list. Do you think it would interfere with weight loss? Mm, it depends on what's in there. You know, what I mean, you know, different salamis are made differently. They can have more sugar or other sorts of things in them. Um, a lot of you know the spices and the seasonings, the hotter ones, all, all those sorts of things you probably want to avoid. You know the the capsicum pepper ones those are those are nightshades right so those are less good for you uh black peppers not great for you either you know plenty of oxalates and other sorts of things in there that you don't want and you know but at the end of the day i mean it's it's still a lot better than a lot of other things it's also expensive you know salami's not cheap you know and so um you you would do better on just whole meat cheaper too right but um you know some salami while it's not you know the the optimal ideal is still going to be a lot better than a lot of other things especially if you're just getting you know the 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 very mild not have a whole bunch of seasonings in it i it's one that i tend to avoid so i like salami too and i will get it sometimes but i mean like every few months i might have a bit of salami you know, and the, but you know, I really, I really feel a lot better without any of the spices and seasonings. And so, even though I like salami, I, I do avoid it for that reason. And uh, as far as you know, interfering with with weight loss, um, the spices, you know, probably not so much as you'd appreciate, unless there's there are a lot of spices in it, and especially sugars and, and things like that. Um, but if you're if you're stalling on weight loss, it's not going as fast as you think it should. Then just cut it out. You know, it's going to cause a bit more inflammation. It's going to not be as good as just you know plain old meat. And you know, you can see, and you can just you know try thirty days without the salami and see for yourself. You know what what difference that makes for you. Um, it will make a difference. You know, if you're eating just a buttload of salami, that's going to be. Uh, that's going to affect you. You know, you're going to get a lot of stuff from those those spices and seasonings that you don't really want. So I would try coming off for 30 days and just eating whole meats and uh, and look at the difference and see see what it does for you. If you're you're losing more weight and doing better, then you know keep doing that. And uh, and uh, and if it's not really making too much of a difference and you enjoy a bit of salami, you know, go for it. But uh, you know, everyone's different and, and it's going to react a little differently to those inappropriate sort of foods. We all benefit the same from the good foods, right? Just fatty meat, but you know some of the spices some people do better or worse with. So I would just check that out for yourself and see if that's worth it to you to keep the salami. And for me, it's not. And I don't even react that strongly to to these sorts of things. Um, I'm, I'm sort of lucky in that regard, but I don't uh, I don't want it. I just I want to feel my best all the time, and so that's what I do. Uh, thank you for the super chat, Southern Joe. Uh, can we go over high LDL and its effects? Well, LDL is not LDL is not LDL. So there are a number of different types of LDL uh, particles and particulates. So, you know, uh, in broad terms, you have like the, the, the large buoyant LDL. These are the ones that, that you make that are good for you. These are just normal transport molecules that, that move your cholesterol around your body and, uh, and are good for you uh, by design. Then there's a small dense LDL that can either be from you know damaging the large buoyant LDL or you know just just made funny because you're eating a bunch of fructose and alcohol and other sorts of things that are that are causing problems, and then you get these these different particulates. Those are those are more strongly correlated with heart disease, but you know I am not convinced that it's a cause of heart disease. You know, they're, they're getting into places that they shouldn't, they're dumping their load, but is it cholesterol or are they dumping plant sterols that are, that mimic cholesterol? Because, you know, there are studies that actually suggest it's actually the plant sterols, the 
fake cholesterol that we're actually told that we should eat because it replaces cholesterol. And we actually lower our, our um, well, it's not even, yeah, lower our, you know, like LDLC. Um, and, uh, you know, and this, and this is somehow, you know, beneficial. Uh, we we have been told right, but in fact, it uh, I don't think that it is. And you get these plant sterols. In fact, you know the LDL molecules don't like. Um, well, your your body doesn't really use this in the normal way as it does your normal cholesterol. It doesn't help with, with your 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 cellular function either because these plant sterols get get put in uh, where cholesterol normally would. And uh, and you get more rigid structures, and it's not as fluid and uh, and healthy, right? And so you get more problems there. And uh, and there are studies that seem to suggest that uh, your body will actually dump out these plant sterols into you know the lining of your of your arteries rather than um, you know your your actual native cholesterol, you know. And so you know those foam cells, those macrophages that pull in a lot of these, these, um, SDLDLs and things like that, which can, which are damaged, right? So normally our liver would take these things up and have this Apple B100, uh, you know, uh, a molecule around it that your liver recognizes, picks that up. If that gets damaged through glycation or oxidation, then you have these, these things floating around these, these SDLDLs that, you know, aren't, uh, you know, able to be picked up by your liver and, and the macrophages, uh, pick these things up, turn into these big foam cells, and they actually really like holding on to the real cholesterol, but they don't like the plant sterols. So they actually dump their load of plant sterols in different areas. This is, this is a problem with trans fats as well. Our body has no idea what to do with this stuff. So it's like, okay, get get rid of this stuff. It ends up building up in in our lining of our arteries and is a, is a, is a known cause of uh, atherosclerosis. So, um. LDL is is it's a very complex thing, but I I don't look at that as a as a necessarily just a straight marker. Like whatever your LDL level is, it's just like that's too basic to you know to think about like you know what what's your cardiovascular disease risk um, just by looking at your LDLC. You know if you're looking at your LDLP, like your your LDL particulates and doing a particulate say that's more uh, that's more likely to give you good information. Um, looking at your HDL and your triglycerides, your HDL to triglyceride ratio, that can give you an idea of whether you have like the pattern A or pattern B uh, LDL particulates. So you have like the large buoyant, which are what you want, uh, or the the small dense sort of guys as well. But then just looking at your metabolic health, so like your HbA1c, your fasting insulin, these sorts of things, you're 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 going to get a lot more information from that. You know, even higher, you know, pattern B uh you know particulates of your ldl it's like so getting more of the small dense uh ldlc right that is you know that, that's a that's a slight increased risk it's like 70 70 to 90 percent increased risk of developing heart disease okay so that's a lot so it's like 1.7 x right but metabolic disease metabolic syndrome is 600 percent increased risk right so it's 6x on heart disease Type 2 diabetes is 10x, so it's a thousand percent increased risk. So I think that that is is probably a better thing to do. And also, the thing, same things that cause uh, metabolic syndrome and diabetes can also precipitate that pattern B uh, cholesterol. So you know that's what I think is more important to focus on. Myself, I do a large uh, dive into the literature on that. And also it was just LDL was just never a marker of disease and, and, and heart disease. It just wasn't, you know, um, that was, that was a fraud. That was a fraud perpetrated on first America and then the world. Um, this is, this is a matter of record. This is in peer reviewed, uh, medical journals and, and it's in, it's in the, you know, the history books now. So the sugar companies, well, the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, published in 2016 actual internal memos from the sugar companies back in the you know, 50s and 60s, detailing how they paid off three Harvard professors to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies to make it appear as if cholesterol caused heart disease when it was really sugar. And one of those professors was named head of the USDA. And it was he who authored and published the 1977 USDA declaration saying that cholesterol caused heart disease. And that saturated fat creates cholesterol. Stop eating both. Stop eating meat. Stop eating eggs. You know, just eat all, all the uh, sugar. And, and that's literally what they said. 
where you want to get away from eating fat, the majority of people's calories were coming from animal fats. I said, Ooh, don't want to do that. So, you know, what do you replace it with? We'll replace it with sugar. It's just an empty calorie. You need those calories. Calories are essential. You have to have calories. And so, you know, you just replace it with sugar. Totally fine. Well, gosh, you know, I wonder, you know, who's paying for your study. And, uh, and it was indeed the sugar company. So I do a, a, a basically a lecture on that on my YouTube channel, on this YouTube channel uh, thing, uh, going through a lot of the detail and that and other other studies that just show that this is this is just utter garbage. And it's just I don't know why people are still looking at this, you know, knowing the fraud that was perpetrated on us. It's just like that that has yet to be proven. Uh, to be something that we need to worry about. Like all of those studies were just fraud. And so, you know, you can lower people's LDLC. It doesn't actually improve their longevity. It doesn't actually lower their stroke or heart attack rate. In fact, in, in a lot of studies, RCTs, randomized controlled trials, they lower the LDL cholesterol and uh, more people die and get more heart attacks, right? So that's not what you want because the whole point here is not lowering cholesterol. The whole point here is protecting you from getting uh, developing cardiovascular disease and heart disease and getting strokes and heart attacks and dying. That's the idea. Now, so people can watch that. It's just called the truth about uh, cholesterol and heart disease. And uh, and you can you can guys can, can see that. Now, there are uh, people out there that are, um, you know, dishonest actors, and they will say, well, you know, the, the mortality rate, from heart disease, cardiovascular disease has actually gone down. It peaked in the 60s and has actually calm, calmed down. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about disease prevalence. We're talking about more people developing heart disease. And since we reduced cholesterol and reduced saturated fat, reduced red meat, reduced uh, all these healthy fats, healthy um, uh, animal fats, and increased fruits and vegetables, increased sugar, increased seed oils, these, these heart healthy canola oils, and, and all these sorts of things that didn't exist that don't exist in nature, didn't exist, you know, even, you know, 50, 60 years ago, some of these things, uh, that somehow those are heart healthy and protective. And that's what you need. And so for the last, you know, you know, you know 90,000 years, 200,000 years, 300,000 years, 2 million years, whatever, uh, that's what protects your heart. So everyone's just dropping dead of heart attacks, just all animals in the wild, just getting heart attack after heart attack after heart attack. Because unfortunately, we just hadn't invented canola oil. You know, oh my God. Well, thank goodness for these, you know, industries and vegans that are pushing this crap out there. Um, that doesn't make any sense. And uh, and and you just you just you know that that you're just not using your brain, or you are trying to sell something, or you're trying to push an ideology, which a lot of these people are. A lot of veganism is wrapped up in in uh, religion. The Seventh Day Adventist Church has pushed that out. They founded the nutritional sciences. They set the curriculum for nutritional sciences. So it's it's no wonder that most nutritionists push a plant based diet because they've been indoctrinated by the Seventh Day Adventist Church, who are anti meat. They're religiously against meat. They think it is uh, that it's a sin against God. That God says told us to stop eating meat because it causes lustful feelings, and so you should eat a bunch of plants to suppress those lustful feelings, those healthy, normal sexual impulses that tell you to breed and interact and have kids. That's literally what we're designed to do is, is procreate. And, and you want to actually suppress that. And so meat doesn't suppress that. Meat promotes that. And so therefore meat is evil because lust is evil. Lust is a sin. And uh, this is actually where it comes from. They founded, you know, sanitarium foods in Australia, you know, Kellogg's cereals that he was a seventh day Adventist. And, uh, and a lot of these, they're all pushing out billions of dollars in re research and marketing and advertising and pushing the curriculum for nutritional sciences. They write the textbooks, they actually write them and they, and they teach the, the university courses. They made the curriculum for the university courses and they founded the lifestyle medicine um, lifestyle medicine uh, specialty as doctors, right? Again, pushing a vegan, plant-based, low meat or no meat lifestyle. That's that's what they're pushing. Uh, it's it's ideologically driven, and so you'll get some of these uh, these people that uh, are will are knowingly trying to mislead people, and they'll say, "Well, death rates have come down." That's not what we're talking about. Since you started eating more canola oil. And since we started eating less meat, less fat, less saturated fat, heart disease rates have increased. First time heart attacks 
have increased in America and around the world, and it's still going up, right? And so, oh, well, deaths have gone down. Okay, well, all, also our interventions have gone, uh, have gotten better, a lot better. So you have a first time heart attack, you go in, you go to the cath lab, you get that clot out, you don't have a big massive chunk of your heart that's now dead and you don't die two, two years later uh, from heart failure, right? Um, or a stroke, we can reverse that so you don't have a big chunk of your brain that dies off, right? So our interventions have gotten better. We've also reduced smoking significantly. And that's also going to have a huge effect on uh, reducing mortality and severity of, of heart disease. And yet heart disease rates and prevalence are still going up, even though we're smoking less. It's just that deaths from heart disease have gone down, but largely that's from redu reduction in smoking. And I think more importantly, our interventions, you know, and our, our prevention, right? So you, you start getting symptomatic sort of chest pain, things like that. You go into the cath lab, you could do a stress or you do a stress test and you're like, Ooh, okay, yeah, you got some blockages. You go into the cath lab and you just get a couple of stents. And so you, you avoid having that heart attack in the first place. And yet first time heart attacks are increasing, right? So anyone who tells you, tries to use that, anyone who use weasel words, to try to change the meaning and direction of a conversation, you know that they're dishonest and you just you just need to sh just shut them down right away because that's not what we're talking about. You know, since we changed and started eating, you know, more uh, seed oils and started reducing our LDLC and like reducing uh, the, you know, saturated fats and red meats and things like that, heart disease rates have gone up. And so it's like, oh, well, 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 death rates have gone down. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what we're talking about, and you damn well know it. So don't let anyone off the hook on that. Don't let them try to, you know, run a red herring and, and shift the conversation to something else. Always keep them on track. Always, you know, keep their nose to the grindstone. So like, no, you need to answer this question. You are avoiding this question, and that's what they all do. They don't have real answers and responses. They just try to obfuscate and uh, and distract. So that's that's a classic distraction. Sorry for the rant. <laughs> Um, so super chat from Mootster. Thank you very much for that. Hello. Have you researched about, um, the Gerson therapy and their protocol for healing cancer? 13 to eight ounces of juice a day, among other things, excludes animal products. Eight of the eight ounce juices are carrot juice. Uh, no, I have not. I've not looked into that protocol. I uh, avoiding meat is definitely not going to help you in cancer. There is z exactly zero evidence that uh, meat, especially unprocessed red meat, has any risk for developing cancer of any form uh, at all. And in fact, the only uh, dietary interventions that have been clinically proven in randomized controlled trials and in large randomized controlled trials and growing body of small, large animal and human uh, randomized controlled trials uh, and interventional trials, case studies, case series, all these sorts of things is a ketogenic diet. That's it. So you can do that with, without meat. You could, I mean, you're not going to get all the nutrients that you really want. You have to take a whole bunch of supplements and things like that. And I think that's going to be harmful, but, it uh, you could do it you know but it, it's really you know just starving the cancer of glucose now uh cancer also needs glutamine some need more than others so like gbm brain cancers require more glutamine than they do glucose and so you could argue well maybe you don't want to eat as much meat well you know there's there's glutamine in everything in, in any sort of plant-based protein as well and we make glutamine right so it's um it's very hard to avoid but i think that you know, potentially fasting, which is which is a mainstay in ketogenic metabolic therapy to try to keep your GKI down, your glucose ketone index down below two or below one if you can. That people that have a lower GKI, they they do better. They tend to do better with any cancer that's really been studied uh, with that. And so, you know, it's um, you know, it's possible that that those periods of fasting also reducing the amount of glutamine coming in could be a benefit. I don't know of any studies that show that one way or the other. However, there are studies showing that taking agents such as Dawn, uh, you know, which, which disrupt glutamine me metabolism, that these uh, do show huge benefits, especially in like the glutamine uh, requiring tumors such as GBM, that, that that is a huge, huge, huge benefit. 
And so, you know, maybe that that's helpful as well. So, you know, I have no idea what the juice is doing, but if it's sugary juices, that's, that's just a really bad idea. And, uh, and eliminating meat, which is literally the stuff of life, I think is not a good idea. And so, you know, I, you know, that may be their therapy protocol, uh, for healing cancer. If they're doing keto, then they might be doing okay. If they're doing periods of fasting, that might, that might be able to help as well. Uh, but really the only thing that's actually shown benefit in, in, in large clinical reproducible trials is a ketogenic diet. And that actually helps with, with chemo and radiation as well. And now, now the lower carbs, the better. So you get your GKI under two, under one, people do better. So if you say you have some studies that say like, oh, well, you can have as much as 50 grams of, of carbs a day. That's not a ketogenic diet. Ketogenic diet is zero. You don't do any of those things. So people that have you know, up to 50 grams a day, they don't do as well as the people that only have up to 20 grams a day. They don't do as well as people who have zero grams a day, right? So you really want to get rid of this stuff. And your GKI is what's important to get down, right? More ketones to less glucose, okay? So that's what's important. And that, that's what seems to make a difference. You could do that with a plant-based diet. You could do that with a juice diet, depending on what you're juicing. But, um, you know, I don't know of any randomized controlled trials that they've put out with you know, a juice fast or the none that I know of with a vegan vegetarian diet. It's just people that have done that and said, hey, I survived cancer and I did vegetarianism or veganism. Therefore, a vegan diet helped me. Well, maybe if you're eating a whole bunch of processed garbage, all plant based anyway, then uh, that, you know, getting rid of that is is a positive and a benefit. If you were doing sort of keto and fasting, you're basically starving on a vegan diet anyway. So maybe um, then, yeah, you know, maybe that would help as well. But, you know, sometimes we associate things, uh, you know, that that don't actually bear, uh, they don't actually have an association, right? So they've done vegan, but they were also doing chemo and radiation and surgery and all these sorts of things. And they survived and oh, must have been the vegan diet. Well, you know, you're doing some other things too. You didn't just do a vegan vegan diet necessarily. You know, I mean, maybe some people did, but um, you know, it's not from lack of meat. Meat does not feed cancer. It doesn't drive cancer. You could you could maybe argue a bit of the glutamine, but a lot of these things don't run on a lot of glutamine. They run mostly on glucose. Some of them, some of them run more on gl glutamine, but it just depends. So uh, I don't know about the Gerson th uh, therapy, but I, you know, those are my thoughts on that anyway. So a super chat from Sarah Perrine. Thank you very much for that. Sometimes I feel hypoglycemic after I eat or if I exert myself, almost a bonk. So you're really not feeling great. Keto from 2021, paleo medicine is carnivore for 68 days. Now low glucose not diabetic, 45 uh, with triple positive breast cancer, no cheat on uh, diet, 2.5 to 3.5 ketones, started pre-keto. Um, so maybe your your hypoglycemic issues started pre-keto. I'm, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. But so yeah, for, so for, for triple triple positive breast cancer, I mean, just, yeah, there, there are actually a lot of studies that show that... Um, there are a lot of benefits from ketogenic metabolic therapy, carnivore diet being one of these things. Uh, Paleo Medicina's uh, carnivore approach is uh, very good, and they're they're putting out a lot of data and publishing material, and and they have have thousands of patients at this point who uh, over the past what, thirteen years or so that they've been doing this, and so that's uh, that's really uh, great that they're they're getting more and more data out there for this. Um, Feeling hypoglycemic after you eat. So after you eat a fatty meal, you're going to be more tired. You know, you're going to divert a lot of blood to your intestines, sometimes as much as 40%. That's blood that's not available to your brain and your muscles. You're going to be tired. You're going to be lethargic. And, and that's very normal. This is why I naturally tend to eat later in the day. Some people like to eat earlier in the day. That's fine. Whatever, whatever feels right for you. But uh, for me, I naturally feel because I eat until you know, I'm stuffed. I, um, or until I just basically don't want to eat anymore, but, but, but until my body's satisfied anyway. And, you know, I, I tend to be very tired after that. And I, I go to sleep. This is why I don't eat a big meal during the day. 
right? Um, I don't know if you've checked your blood sugar. You know, that might be a, a good thing to check. But again, with with um, with your ketones being as high as they are, that's uh, you know something I've spoken about before. You shouldn't you shouldn't be getting a problem even from low blood sugar. So there's studies back in very um, unethical studies back in I think the 50s where they looked at that. And they looked at people with uh, you know higher ketones and say, okay, how does this affect them? And they actually lowered their blood, they ramped up their ketones and then lowered their blood sugar to a point that should put them into a coma, right? And they were fine. They're just sitting up talking normally, conversing. That, yeah, everything's fine. Feel great, no problems. So you know, with ketones that high, even if you did have, you know, low blood sugar or slightly low, then you know you should you should be fine. So oh, there you say. So no low glucose. So basically, you're not having low blood sugar. Sometimes you're feeling hypoglycemic. Okay, so if you're feeling that way, check your blood pressure, check your blood sugar, make sure that those are okay. But you know, if your ketones are high. Your, your blood sugar is is probably not really much of an issue. It's probably more to the point that you're just feeling very tired after you eat a big meal. Try to eat later in the day. Um, and as for anyone having trouble sleeping, eat right before you go to sleep, right? Uh, eat until you're full right before you go to sleep. You're going to be much more tired. You're going to want to naturally just go comatose. I feel amazing when I do that. And I sleep very, very well when I do that as well. So, um, yeah, I hope that helps. Um, I don't think it's a, an issue with what you're eating. I don't think it's an issue with your your blood sugar or your ketones from the sound of it. It's probably more related to just how, how much you're eating and the time of day that you're eating. So I would eat later in the day. Or if you're eating earlier in the day or during the midday, just, just don't eat as much as that. You know, Just eat sort of half as much you want or just a bit to just to get the edge off and, uh, and you know, slake your hun hunger. But uh, not so much that you divert forty percent of your blood supply to your intestines and uh, and get tired. So I would try that and make sure you're drinking enough water as well. That's very important. Uh, super chat from uh, Tier. Thank you very much for that. If eating ruminant meat is one hundred out of one hundred in score on carnivore, uh, what would you say pork is 50, <laughs> 50 out of one hundred? Salmon eggs. Um, it depends on it depends on the individual. Also, very much depends on what that animal is being fed. So, if, if a pig is just is just eating what a pig is supposed to eat in the wild, is just going around naturally foraging, that's going to be a lot better than these farm uh, or feedlot pigs that are just fed a bunch of corn and soy garbage, which they're not supposed to eat. Those seed oils and and plant oils and things like that, uh, linoleic acid, very high omega six and linoleic acid content. That actually, they don't process that. They can't use that. They can't burn that as energy. It just stores up in their fat, and then we eat that fat, and we get that. So that's that's less good. Now, some people are going to be more sensitive to that, especially people with autoimmune issues. And so sometimes people eating, you know, like a pork chop or bacon, uh, will actually flare up their autoimmune issues. Uh, you know, Michaela Peterson has, has spoken about this: how how pork is actually worse for her than eating fruit. You know. And so she really needs to avoid that. And, and that's, I would say that that's a large reason why is what that animal is being fed itself. So eggs as well. What is the chicken being fed? Is it, is it out there eating bugs, insects, and, you know, little lizards, you know, those eggs are probably okay. You know, some people have a bit of a sensitivity usually to the egg whites. And, um, and if so, then you can just avoid them. A lot of people do just fine on that salmon great as long as it's wild caught not farmed salmon and uh you know it's about 60 percent ca uh, calories from fats or eggs and so maybe just just melt in some grass-fed butter on that as well so it is individual ruminant meat is much better so like you know uh grain finished ruminant meat is like a 98 you know grass-fed finished regeneratively raised ruminant meat would be 100 i would say and uh you know or again going back to moose you know wild caught moose delicious and uh, and they're probably up there in 100 as well you know it's eating what it's supposed to eat hopefully and, uh, and so it's going to be as healthy as it, it, it can possibly be so a lot of the problems with with pork salmon eggs chicken all that sort of stuff has to do with what the animal's being fed so it's hard to put a number on that but um 
you know, if if we're saying that pork is 50, which I think is much, much better than that, because if it's all out of 100, you know, plants are going to be basically below 50. All meat is going to be above 50. And uh, but, you know, pasture raised pigs and wild caught salmon and, and so on, those are going to be better than their counterparts, certainly. And it does seem that the ruminant animals, even when fed stuff that they're not supposed to eat, they do better and they detoxify that better than other animals do. And in fact, there was a there was a recent article that came out that that suggested that ruminant animals uh, could actually uh, detoxify and eliminate uh, glyphosate, you know, all like Roundup and things like that, which is horrible. And so, you know, even grain grain fed finished cows, they're not going to have the glyphosate that's coming in that that maybe could be getting in into the, the other meat being fed garbage that has this Roundup poison put on it as well. So super chat from Anita Hale. Thank you very much for that. Any advice in transitioning a 16 year old athlete into switching from high carb to carnivore and keep up with her three hour a day training schedule, trying to resolve uh, acne and PCOS. So yeah, well, so, so the transition, I think you, you should, well, it's, it's, it's a bit difficult because <laughs> If you sort of try to try to slowly transition, the, she's going to have energy issues, right? Because she's not going to be eating enough uh, carbs to maintain uh, her activity level, and so her insulin is going to be going up, blood sugar is going to be going down. She's not going to be able to produce all this stuff from eating meat. So, it, you know, you you can sort of try to just start adding in more meat, adding in more fatty meat, and things like that, and then just like you know, one day just say, okay, we're going to get rid of the carbs and the sugar and all that sort of stuff, and certainly seed oils. Get rid of that. Just throw all that out of your house. No one should have cooking oils in their house. You're just using uh, tallow or ghee, you know, grass-fed tallow or ghee, um, or, or you know, lard or whatever. Uh, but you know, depending on how the lard was raised, you know, it might have the more linoleic acids and things like that. So I would probably stick to grass fed tallow and ghee uh, as cooking cooking fats um, and get rid of everything else and just start eating more meat um, you know if she's in the middle of her season when she stops carbohydrates and just does just meat and fat some people notice you know like feeling a bit off um, a lot of that's from withdrawals from sugar and carbs and caffeine even and uh, and can feel pretty low because of that. Um, some people have a difference in uh, their metabolism, where it takes a bit longer for them to get fat adapted, keto adapted. I didn't have any any sort of lag period. You know, as soon as I dropped carbs and just started eating more meat, I just felt better right away. I had better energy right away. I was just doing better and better and better and better and better. Uh, some people will notice that they have a bit of a lag, need to make sure you're drinking enough water, need to make sure that you're eating enough fatty meat. Don't eat during the day. Eat at night. Eat after the workout. Very important. If you're going to eat before the workout, eat several hours before the workout. Don't eat that much right? Or you're going to get lethargic and you're going to divert your blood uh, from your muscles and your brain. And that's not what you want. So I basically never eat during the day unless I'm just like just ravenous. And then I'll, again, just do that. I'll just eat enough to just take the edge off and that's it. And, uh, and I certainly won't eat like a full meal, even five hours before uh, I work out. I want to work out and train on an empty stomach. I always, um, I always played hungry. That's how I, I said it. And I you know, talk to people. I always, I always advise my teammates and others. Just you always play hungry. You always play hungry. You're always going to do better if you're on an empty stomach. And, uh, and that would go for, for her as well. Um, you have plenty of energy available, even if you didn't eat the whole day of a, of a, you know, of a, of a competition or whatever, you're going to be fine. I've done, you know, uh, full day tournaments with rugby, you know, playing six games in a day, didn't eat the whole time, always felt great, always regretted it if I ate. I've only done that a few times, always regretted it every single time. And so that's what I would do. Uh, I'd just be aware that there could be a bit of a lag period while she's adjusting to that. Make sure she's getting enough fat. Make sure she's eating after her workouts, getting enough water. She'll do a lot better with that. And uh, I do, I have a video on high performance training on a carnivore diet. 
that's uh, and there's a, a, a playlist that I have on my YouTube channel, just called I think it's just bodybuilding and athletics or something like that. And uh, so there, there's a lot of things in there as well you can go over. But once she gets through that transition period and she sort of figures out how much she needs to eat and when she needs to eat it, um, because she may need to eat more than once a day based on her uh, her output and things like that. But if she is just eat a long time uh, before she has to work out or after she works out uh, if possible. And if if it is sort of, you know, she has to eat a couple of times during the day, you know, try to eat less during the day, especially if she has to work out later. It's very important. And so if she has like a morning workout, don't eat before that, eat after that. And then the afternoon workout or, you know, evening workout or whatever, again, be basically have that little bit then and then don't eat until after that as well. That will make a big difference. Uh, there are people that transition mid season. I was one of them. I felt great doing it. Uh, I know a number of other people that have done it mid season. They felt amazing doing it. Some people that, Oh, and you know, my energy levels are a bit lower or whatever that can happen potentially to some people for a couple of weeks. It gets better. You know, you just have to keep eating enough and drinking enough water and, and doing the timing. As I mentioned, um, there's a good, uh, example that in that, you know, the, the, that podcast with athletes and bodybuilders is, uh, or bodybuilders and athletes, um, is, uh, Ryan Talbot, who's, uh, NCAA, NCAA one, uh, two time all American in the decathlon on carnivore diet. He transitioned mid season and he said he, he felt great. He said he felt a bit of that sort of those transition -y sort of weirdness, but he said it didn't, uh, you know, affect him enough that it actually slowed down his, his performance or his progression. And after a couple of weeks, then he, he was off to the races. You know, he was one that, you know, we had to adjust how much he was eating. He was sort of losing too much weight. And, um, so we, we, you know, he was adding in, you know, more meal times, but having to adjust them for when he was working out because he obviously had a lot of trainings during the day. And, uh, and now he's, he's just, you know, hitting a stride. And in fact, he was saying that he has to work out less because he, uh, he's putting on too much muscle when he works out, he puts on muscles too easily, uh, on a carnivore diet that he, you know, he, he's putting on too much weight and he wants to be more light, you know, for the high jump and the pole vault and, and, and sprinting and all these sorts of things. So it's kind of funny. So th this will make a huge, huge, huge difference for her athletically. Um, you know, three hours a day training, that's, that's exactly what you want to do is, is be on a carnivore diet because you can, you can just go, you'll be making blood sugar, glycogen, ketones throughout that entire experience. If you're not eating a carnivore diet, then, or an, a ketogenic diet needs to be a ketogenic carnivore diet, then you're going to have to keep feeding the beast. You're going to have to keep drinking sodas and sugary drinks and all that other garbage in order to maintain your blood sugar. Uh, that's not what you want as an athlete. So I uh, know I can tell you, I can work out for, you know, six, eight, 10 hours. And I, and I was when I was playing high level rugby, uh, just on car without eating all day, I wouldn't eat for a couple days in a row. I was not eating enough. You need to eat enough. And I, I that's why I stress this so much on, with people that it's very easy to under eat on a carnivore diet because your hunger signals are so much more, uh, subtle than they would ever have been before that when you're eating carbohydrates. So just be very mindful of that, very careful of that. Make sure she's eating enough, eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good. If she finishes and goes like, yeah, no, I feel fine. But yeah, that last bite tasted good. Make another steak, make some more eggs, do something else, right? It's very important that she gets enough, especially uh, as an athlete. Hopefully that helps. And do check out that uh, playlist, the, the, bodybuilding and, and athletes or whatever is something on there that's specifically for athletics and, um, and carnivore on my, on my playlist selection on there. Uh, super chat from Tommy. Thank you very much for that. Uh, got reactive hypoglycemia and big from big protein meals cause massive crashes, uh, similar to carb meals. Interesting. Okay. Only meat and water for weeks and still crash hard after meals. OMAD three smaller meals, uh, with same crashing results, any advice? Well, then I would, I would, well, it could be a blood sugar issue, but I would check your blood sugar to see if that's what's going on because it could be, you know, what, what I've spoken about here, uh, previously, which is, um, you will just naturally get lethargic and tired after 
after a big meal of meat, three smaller meals with the same crashing results, you know, that is probably more likely to do with the fact that your, your body's just saying, Hey, you know, you've got these nutrients, you've got these resources, chill out, rest, rest and digest. You're going to, going to activate your parasympathetics, right? Your rest and digest mode, right? And your body's going to say, yep, we got resources, take it easy, right? So that's why I don't eat during the day because I get that. I don't want to, I don't want to get that. I've got things to do. I've got a lot, a lot of work and I've got, you know, uh, if I'm able to time it so I can go to the gym, then, then I want to be fully active and energized for that. And so that's important, uh, to do as well. So I would just eat later in the day, uh, after you're done for the day, after you've done your workout or finished work or whatever, just have a big meal and, uh, and then just have that time in with, going to bed. It's okay to eat right before you go to bed on a carnivore diet, you know, eating before bed. I think really the only problem that that, uh, comes with is if you're eating a standard American or, you know, standard diet with a bunch of carbs, you're eating carbohydrates, carbohydrates and raise insulin. That's going to disrupt all your nighttime hormones, such as melatonin and growth hormone. You get maximal secretion of growth hormone after you go to sleep. And so insulin blocks the, the, uh, secretion of growth hormone. So you're going to produce less growth hormone, which is a very important hormone. And it will also block the action of growth hormone. So less is going to be produced. And then, you know, what has come out is now going to be less active, right? So that really, really messes you up uh, when you eat carbohydrates in general. This is why I think, you know, like, you know, people trying to develop their body, athletes, people work out trying to be a bodybuilder or whatever, you're really hurting yourself by eating carbs. And people, oh, yeah, eat all these carbs, eat all these carbs, this is going to create this anabolic sort of whatever. Uh, okay. In the sense that insulin is anabolic and is going to, uh, grow tissue fine, but it's also, it's going to grow fat, right. As, as well as other things. Right. So, and, and, you know, we secrete growth hormone every 60 minutes for men, every 90 minutes for women. And, um, you know, maximally after we go to sleep and when we work out, we do a big, heavy leg day or something like that. You'll, you'll pump out a lot of growth hormone. Well, you're going to pump out a lot less if you're eating carbs and what does come out is going to be less active and every 60 minutes, you're going to produce less if you're having high insulin and that is going to be less active. So this is why I see in people's lab results, even if they're not working out or anything like that, I see their IGF one go up, I see their testosterone go up or in women, their estrogen go up, right? So their hormones improve dramatically, even in later age middle-aged and elderly people, they will also get these improvements as well, because it's just, you're just not disrupting your body's normal physiology. So, uh, ho hopefully that helps and you can get your, your timing down that, it, that it's not causing that, you know, um, you know, if you're having high ketones, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a blood sugar issue and uh, really shouldn't be a blood sugar issue anyway. It shouldn't really tank your blood sugar. Um, but if you, I mean, you're saying you have high reactive hypoglycemia. So I don't know if that's because you're, you, you feel like that's what it is, or you've actually tested it. Uh, if you've tested it, but your ketones are still up, it's still, again, you know, you can have lower blood sugar and high ketones. It shouldn't make you feel like that. It is generally more to do with, uh, crashes in energy from activating parasympathetics and going into rest and digest mode and, and your body just saying, Hey, we have nutrients, stop wasting them. You know, we, we don't need to use any more nutrients. We don't need to use any more energy. We got the food that we need. Take a nap. You know, the lion takes down a gazelle. They they eat that and they sleep for 14 hours. You know, that's normal. Okay. So just, uh, just you know, remember that when, when you're going into it. Uh, Super chat from SS. Thank you very much. Do you think a pregnant carnivore still needs pregnancy vitamins? No, probably not. But you know, check your numbers, right? I mean, it's you know, taking a vitamin isn't uh, isn't isn't the end of the world. You know, most of that was just going to you know be peed out. But uh, you know, I, I don't I don't think you want to mess around with <laughs> your pregnancy and childbirth because it, you know little things can go wrong and, and be an issue. Some people do need a bit more folate. Uh, even on a carnivore diet, if they're not eating a bit of liver, um, because you know, especially people with like the MTHFR gene, they're just not going to, you know, uh, metabolize folate as well. And so they may need a bit more in their diet and usually just a bit of liver a couple times a week sorts that out. Um, so a pregnancy vitamin, 
really is just liver. You know, it's just adding in a bit of liver and, uh, you know, you know, a couple times a week, a few times a week, three times a week should be fine. If you check your numbers and your folate's a bit down, take something, absolutely take something, increase the amount of liver you're eating or, or take a pregnancy vitamin. I don't, you know, if it's just, if it's just vitamins, it's, it, it sh you know, there shouldn't be a problem taking those. So you just cover your bases. Um, but no, but I mean, you know, people doing carnivore around the world are having babies, you know, the Inuits are having babies and historically have had babies. Now the f meat that they're eating are not farm raised grain fed animals that are less nutrient dense. Right. So that's something to consider. We're not eating wild mammoth anymore, wild horses or, or wild, you know, uh, you know, cattle and bison. So, you know, it could be that you just need a bit more liver or organs while you're pregnant, but most people will be perfectly fine. So you can always check your levels and then just have a bit of liver just to be safe. I think it's probably advisable. Um, and if you want to take a vitamin too, it's not going to hurt you, but most people won't need it, but you, you don't know unless you check. So, uh, I would check. Question from True Health. Thank you very much for the super chat. Eating a standard American diet. I had alkaline phosphatase in the 50s. Now it's in the low 30s with Ketovore for a year now. Thoughts? Well, it's good. You know, things are, you know, your alkaphos is uh, coming down. A lot of people's liver function improves on, on a carnivore diet. So, um, and that's just that's just a sign that your liver is improving. You know that it's not being as stressed out and burdened by the things that you're eating, and it can just sort of do its its normal thing. So, um, so I think that's that's uh, a positive thing. You know that your body's just you know just getting uh, getting better in objective in an objective way. So that's good. Uh, super chat from Jeff Barry. Thank you very much for that. Six foot one, 300 pounds, 2.5 weeks into carnivore and have lost all hunger. Uh, yep. That happens. Uh, three days since my last meal, should I force myself to eat or keep going? Energy is fine. Um, you don't need to force yourself, but just remember that your hunger signals are going to be very, very different on a carnivore diet. As I said, when I was first doing this, you know, 20 plus years ago, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't eat for days at a time. And I was, I was quite slender, you know, and I was working out six, eight hours a day. Right. And I just wouldn't eat because I wasn't hungry because I didn't feel hungry in the way that I normally felt hungry. And I didn't realize I had to relearn my hunger signals. Right. No one explained that to me. So I'm trying to explain this to other people not to fall into that trap. So it's about taste. If meat tastes good, then you are hungry. You have to relearn your hunger signals. They're going to be so much more subtle. You're not going to feel hungry like you have ever before when you're eating carbs and sugar ever, right? So you need to relearn your hunger signals. If you're feeling a bit off or a bit funny or a bit like, hmm, okay, ask yourself, or you're having carb cravings or smelling bread, hmm, that bread smells good. Ask yourself, okay, is that is this hungry? Is this what hungry feels like? Try eating some meat or eggs. If they taste good, you are hungry. Keep eating until it stops tasting good, right? So if a steak tastes good, if, if meat tastes good, that means that you're hungry. That means your body wants those nutrients, right? So it's giving you, it's giving you, um, you know, that that positive reinforcement, saying yes, eat this. But then that gives negative feedback, right? So you eat that, and it's going to taste less good the next time, and less good the next time, and less good the next time, until a point that uh, that you'll reach that will be you don't enjoy it. It doesn't taste good. That's the point that you're not hungry anymore. That's when you're full. So I would try eating, you know, just like some fatty meat, right? And if that doesn't taste good, don't eat it. That's fine. Three days, you probably, a steak's probably going to taste good. And if it does taste good, I would eat that, you know, because you don't want to eat so little that you suppress your metabolism because you'll have other problems on, on the other side of that. Once you start eating again, then you're going to start putting on weight again because your body's like, well, we were in a famine. We were just starving. We need to put on some stores for the next famine. So, you know, it is it is normal, honestly, in the wild for predators to not eat every day, you know, maybe even once a week. You know, Genghis Khan, the Mongol horde, you know, like depending on on who you read, uh, they would go, you know, they would just ravage the countryside for five days in a row and then without eating. And then they'd eat 10 pounds of horse meat and do it again. 
you know? So it's not necessarily a problem that you're not, that, you know, you don't eat for three days. If your body is telling you that, or re even really in a survival sort of mode, you can refeed like the, the Mongols did and just, just eat every several days or whatever. Um, but I don't, I don't think that's necessary. I think that, you know, if your body's asking for food and you have food available, you know, you just give it to it and you'll, you'll keep your metabolism high. So I would just try eating at least once a day and try eating fatty meat or eggs with butter. And if it tastes good, keep eating until it stops tasting good. Right. And then if it, if you take one bite and go, nope, not for me, fine. You know, that's fine. But I would at least try once a day and see how you go. And then, and then just relearn your hunger signals because they're just, they're just very different on a carnivore diet. Brian Torres, thank you very much for the super chat question. Does one get all required vitamins and minerals through the carnivore diet? Also thoughts on plant polyphenols. Uh, yes, you absolutely get everything you need in the proportion that you need it on a carnivore diet. Now that's not to say that you'll, you'll reach the RDAs because the RDAs are designed and developed when people were eating a mixed diet. And so depending on what you eat, you'll need a different constellation of nutrients. Okay. So if you're only eating meat, then you get everything you need just from meat, fatty meat, very important. Uh, and especially if it's, you know, grass fed and finished and all that sort of stuff. Again, maybe some people might need a bit of liver to add in if you're doing grain finished and, and so on, because it's just not as nutrient dense, but it's pretty damn nutrient dense. And so for me, I, I've checked my, my bloods and my minerals and vitamins, grass finished Costco beef is just fine for me, apparently. Uh, some people may have a bit, bit low folate. Fine. Add in some liver. Okay. Plant polyphenols. Don't want them. Don't need them. Don't have them. That's my thought. Um, some of these things are maybe, you know, okay. Others are not. A lot of these things are toxic. You know, plants make chemicals, a lot of chemicals in or, you know, to defend themselves. Uh, they make around a million different chemicals. Most of those are to poison or damage or deter animals from eating them, right? So you don't you really don't want them. And you know, you can you can argue, oh well, you know, maybe in some doses and this, that, and the other, they can be sort of used medicinally. Whatever. That's not what we're talking about. We are not talking about medicine. We are talking about normal, basic, functional nutrition. What do you need? You don't need any plant polyphenols at all. And I don't think you benefit from it. And even if there were some that you would benefit from like medicinally, right. Or, or whatever, uh, what else is it coming up, coming up with? Right. Because you know, the, you know, you, you get that one nutrient or ingredient from the plant that maybe you want, right. But it's coming with, a, with another 150,000 other chemicals. What do those do? Right. So that's not how we do medicine. Right. You know, we, we, we identify and isolate a specific compound and we, we, we test that closely in animals and people and so on. And we try to get the right dose, right? Say, this is the reference. This is the, the treatment range. This is how much you need. This is the minimum. This is the maximum, right? This is this, the safe and effective doses, right? They're going to have side effects. They're not, not, no medicine is ever going to be completely safe, but you know, that's because these things are poison actually. And so, you know, medicine is just a poison that in certain doses at certain times confer uh, more of a benefit than harm. Right. So, so the good outweighs the bad, but there is bad. And in fact, it is bad. Generally, these things are developed as a toxin, right? So digitalis, digoxin in foxglove, right? So that helps you if you have, uh, you know, uh, um, Heart failure can can make the contractility of your heart stronger, right? Fine. Um, it can also cause arrhythmias and kill you if you get out of uh, out of the range, right? Or even if you're in range, that's just a risk, right? Um, that plant did not make that hundreds of millions of years ago in order to one day help humans who had heart failure. That's obviously not the case. So what did, it, what did it make it for? It made it to stop the hearts of animals that are trying to eat it, right? So you get that in, you eat that, and all of a sudden you just go, and you, just, and you have an arrhythmia and you die, you know, because it does not want you to eat it. It does not want you to survive and benefit from eating it. Now we use it as microdoses, literally micrograms of digoxin, digitalis, 
and uh, and for certain people in certain circumstances at extremely small doses, then then that that can confer a benefit. Uh, but that's not nutrition; that's medicine. And again, too much is going to kill you. Could kill you. The vast majority of plants on Earth will kill you. Right? They're inedible, meaning that they're so toxic that they even a small amount will make you extremely sick or even kill you. Now they say, well, you know, I had a spinach salad the other day, therefore it's not po poisonous. You're an idiot because you know, a cigarette, you, um, people smoke cigarettes daily. They don't die either. They drink alcohol weekly, daily. They don't die. It takes decades to build up. Are we saying that cigarettes and alcohol are not poison? They're not bad for you? That's idiotic, you know? And so, you know, it just, it just, it, uh, it's just so silly. For people to to make arguments like that that literally they did not use their brain for one fraction of a second you know because of course that's ridiculous you have a thousand examples uh you know of, of showing the absurdity of that right so um you know slow poison is still poison you can smoke cigarettes every day of your life and uh, not die of cancer you know you'll get emphysema you know you'll have other sorts of issues cardiovascular disease and, and uh, peripheral vascular disease and all these sorts of things, um, you know, but it didn't kill you that day. You know, people drink a lot of alcohol. There are a lot of alcoholics out there. There are a lot of people that just recreationally drink and socially drink. Does that mean that alcohol is not bad for them? Does that mean that alcohol is not a poison because it just didn't kill them? They didn't die of acute alcohol poisoning. It's only a poison. It's only damaging when it when it has a chance to kill you acutely. No, of course not. That's that's uh, ridiculous. So, um, you know, these things do build up, and they they can cause harm. We have an, we have a certain ability to detoxify these things. We have a certain ability to detoxify alcohol, and smoking, you know, and cigarettes, and all these other sorts of things. It's limited, you know, and you can reach that very quickly. You know, people don't realize how quickly they'll reach it. You know, our body can can deal with oxalates. And, uh, you know, Liam Hemsworth put himself in the hospital with acute oxalate poisoning after three weeks of, of spinach smoothies, right? Massive kidney stones, had to get surgery to take him out, right? Couldn't pass them, okay? And he, um, you know, was, was uh, you know, experienced this himself. But, you know, you know, most people can tolerate and detoxify and eliminate about 150 milligrams of oxalates a day. So people say, oh, well, you know, collagen breaks down and, you know, a byproduct that can be oxalates. Yeah, like two milligrams, you know, comes from 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 collagen um, degradation, right? So it's really not, it's just not meeting the bar of concern. So you can deal with about 150 milligrams of oxalates. Oh, okay, so that's fine. Well, no, not really. Half a cup of spinach has over 600 milligrams of oxalates. So, so you reach that threshold very quickly, much more quickly, than, than people understand or recognize or appreciate. People just do not respect the toxins that are in plants nearly as much as they should. Uh, these, these things are not messing around. They are trying to survive and they will kill you if uh, they have to. And if they can, you know, most plants will kill most animals, even herbivores, right? Herbivores in the wild, they eat very specific plants. They do not go outside of that. And if they do, they die. Or they get very sick. There's there's a lot of different diseases and maladies, conditions in veterinary medicine, livestock medicine. You know where animals get into livestock, get into something, and eat plants that they're not designed to eat uh, because they're stuck in a pasture and they run out of food. Usually, it just it usually doesn't happen in the wild. Um, and then they get they get sick. The big head, limp neck, you know, uh, crazy cow syndrome. All these things we we've named these maladies, and we know that they come from eating the wrong plant. Right. So one of my thoughts on on polyphenols, people can look at my my video uh, just called Plants Are Trying to Kill You <laughs> um, on my channel. And also, the lecture that I gave at uh, you know, Metabolic Health Summit um, with Low Carb Down Under. So it's on the Low Carb Down Under um, uh, YouTube channel. People can can watch that for a more in-depth look at the different uh, plant toxins and what they they do to us. <laughs> So super chat from Bishop's Deep Learning. Thank you very much for that. Best way to gain mass on carnivore. Should I eat past society more fat? Thanks. No, I don't. I don't think you need to, to eat past society. You want to get well. If you want to gain fat, you know, you can you can force feed yourself. Uh, you'll still only absorb a certain amount of fat. It's very difficult to absorb fat after that. You want to get enough fat. You want to get enough protein. So you need to get enough of both. And 
um, and 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 then stimulate your body and trigger your body to put on mass, right? So what does that mean? That means working out. So you need to sprint, you need to lift weights, and then you need to eat enough to uh, to support that. Like if I'm working out regularly, I will put on lean muscle mass very easily, but I have to eat enough. I generally increase my appetite, increases about you know, double. Uh, if I'm if I'm working out a lot, I'm not always able to eat that because I'm just, you know, busy. And so if I'm not able to eat that, you know, I'll, I'll put on weight, I'll put on lean muscle, I'll get more, uh, you know, uh, lean and muscular, but I won't necessarily put on as much bulk. If I'm able to eat enough to satiety and eating more than once a day, because that's, that's really what I need when I'm working out a lot, I need to eat a couple times a day because I can't just get enough in one go. Then, uh, then I put on weight, then I put on muscle mass very easily. So if you want to gain mass, if you want to gain lean muscle mass, then you just, you need to work out, you need to lift weights, you need to sprint and, or just lift weights. And, um, I like sprinting. I think sprinting is one of the best leg exercises and workouts that you can do and just, just workouts in general. It just, it just stimulates a lot of very good, healthy things and, uh, and you just feel good. You feel very athletic and very just you know, dynamic, you're just out there, you can feel you just, you just bust out and sprint and, you know, you know, tackle somebody who's, you know, robbing someone, you just feel good, you know, you just feel like you're, you're physically capable. And, uh, and so I like that, but either way, you have to do something that stimulates your muscle growth. And then you have to, I think, eat to satiety. I think your body is going to be able to tell you exactly how much it needs, uh, you know, in order to put on muscle mass because you're stimulating muscle growth and says, okay, well, you want to stimulate that muscle growth. Great. You need to bring in these nutrients. So eat until you're satiated fatty meat, uh, you know, um, and, uh, try eating at least twice a day, right? Because you, you will, if you're working out a lot, you're going to need, you're going to need to eat more often, but I don't think you need to eat past satiety in one go. Just eat to satiety, eat until it stops tasting. So eat till, when I say satiety, I mean until it stops tasting good because just feeling satiated, that's different because it's very different. It's a very different feeling. So eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. Do that at least twice a day as you're working out and uh, and you'll put on mass. You will absolutely put on, on lean muscle mass for sure. If you want to put on fat, eat carbs. Um. Ryan Maudib, thank you very much for the super chat. Um, for years, I have gotten full quickly. Same happening on carnivore. I fear gastroparesis uh, via MS for 20 years. Worried about under eating. Last Friday, went to the ER, had hypokalemia. Worried about repeat. Um, yeah, well, it depends on, on what's causing the hypokalemia. That's, uh, that is concerning, of course. That's not, um, that's not good. And so, you know, if you need to take a bit of, you know, electrolytes like potassium and things like that, then, then do, you know, um, generally hypokalemia will come from metabolic issues, vomiting profusely, things like that. That's how you're going to, you know, uh, disrupt your, uh, electrolytes a lot. You can do that that way. If you're getting gastroparesis and you're vomiting and, you know, that can be a problem. So I don't, I don't know the whole story there, but. Um, you know, if you need to take some potassium for your particular medical issues at the moment, then do, you know, please do don't, don't, uh, let your body stay, uh, in, in that hypoclimic state. Gastroparesis, that's a problem. Um, MS tends to improve when people that I've seen that have gone on a carnivore diet have improved. I have a, I have an interview with, uh, with a young lady who's had MS and was wheelchair bound and, uh, went on a carnivore diet and she, like, well, and, and I think it was like in six months, she was back doing ballet from a wheelchair. So that's amazing. And, you know, she's, she's a, a PhD and a, and a um, you know, a biomedical researcher. She does biostatistics and, uh, and, and is, uh, is a therapist and things like that. So, you know, very, very smart lady, very well educated. And she came to this, you know, looking at things going like, yeah, you know what, I'm convinced of this. And it, and it helps, it helps her a lot. So, you know, if that's a, a result of your MS that can improve, um, gastroparesis, meaning, you know, you no know, sort of paralyzed stomachs and doesn't, you know, empty as, as well as you could. It doesn't, you know, stretch out either. You just need to, uh, eat more often. You know, so it'd be the same sort of advice that I would give someone who had a gastric sleeve or, you know, bariatric surgery. First of all, 
don't get bariatric surgery. It is, uh, it's not good for you. It's really bad and um, can have very serious complications from the surgery itself, just acutely, and you can heal incorrectly from it and have very serious issues. Uh, you can you can die, obviously, in extreme cases. That is rare you know, with any surgery. It's very rare, but you can have very serious side effects from it, and people can die. You know, I mean, any surgery, your risk of dying, you know, especially with a general anesthetic and um, and and you can have very serious problems, infections and so on. Uh, but then 10, 15 years down the track, you can have other problems that crop up because of that. And you have to have more surgeries, you know. So, you know, is that really uh, the best thing to do for our body? Obviously, for some people, that's the only option that they they. Uh, you know, that they think that they have because they've tried other things they haven't worked. Okay. So, you know, try this first, try to get people on this first. If they're, you know, family or friends that, um, that, uh, you know, are in that position where they're sort of struggling and they think that maybe, you know, surgery is the way to go, try to get them doing this first. It, it will help. And it, uh, you know, some people take longer to lose weight, but uh, they will eventually, and they'll gain health immediately, and that's the most important thing. Um, so for them, they have smaller stomachs. You know, they've cut off most of that. Really bad idea. I uh, get super uh, severe uh, malabsorption issues. You can cut off the areas of your stomach that makes intrinsic factor, so now you can't absorb vitamin B12 for the rest of your life. You have to get injections forever. You know, you get uh, iron malabsorption. You have to get transfusions for the rest of your life. I mean, this is just, this is not worth it, you know? And so just eat meat, be happy. And, um, but for gastroparesis, same idea. You know, you're just going to need to eat more often. So don't drink water around the meal. Try to not drink water for at least an hour before you eat so that all of your stomach is available all the all the the volume is available for meat fatty meat right so you just eat that you let that go and then you try to eat again several times throughout the day and uh, don't drink water during the meal and try not to drink water within an hour of eating so that you maximize the the capacity of your stomach for uh, meat and if this is something to do with the MS and the MS improves, that could improve as well. But, you know, you just have to logistically deal with it as you can, you know. So if that was happening before carnivore, it's happening during carnivore, same idea. Just just space out your meals throughout the day and uh, and to, to get enough meal, uh, to, get, to get enough nutrition and, you know, take, take uh, electrolyte supplements if you have to. There might be something else going on that's causing hypokalemia. That's not normal on a carnivore diet. The carnivore diet shouldn't cause that. So there's going to be something else underlying, most likely, uh, that's an issue. Uh, whatever, take take some take some electrolytes. You know, just just cover cover your bases. Super chat from David R. Uh, thank you very much for that. A lot of people don't know about oxalate dumping. Um, there's a right way to do it based on. Uh, previous diet. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. And, um, you know, oxalate dumping can, can sort of hit people sideways, you know, after several months or even a couple of years, I spoke to, with Sally Norton and she said that she's seen a lot of carnivores do really well in going on a carnivore diet and, uh, and they don't really get a lot of the oxalate dumping, even though they have a lot built up in their tissue and there seems to be a delay. And she thinks that it might have something to do with the fact that we don't, we're not, you know, unless you're having dairy, they are not getting a huge amount of calcium in your diet. And so there's nothing for the, that oxalate to sort of bind on and grab onto and, and make calcium oxalate sort of stones and crystals throughout your body or in your kidneys. <clears throat> but she said that, you know, <clears throat> she's seen a few people on a carnivore diet after about three years, all of a sudden start experiencing some of those oxalate dumping sort of things. And so that can happen. <clears throat> so it's always something to keep in the back of your mind, you know, go through the, the list of other things. Um, you know, it could be, are you eating enough? Are you eating enough fatty meat? Are you eating anything else, drinking anything else? Uh, are you drinking enough water, doing all these things? Um, and, you know, can those things be addressed? Can those help your, your issues? You've covered all those bases and you're having a lot of weird issues, weird joint pains, weird, you know, crusty, weird eyes. You know, you, you, all of a sudden you bang off and get kidney stones after three years of not eating any plants and you're getting calcium and a calcium oxalate stone three years after you've taken in any appreciable amounts of oxalates. You know, you have to you have to start looking at oxalate dumping at that point, and so you know, speaking with Sally, she says that a lot of people 
um, won't have the, even if they do have oxalate dumping, they won't have like the major, major, major uh, problems that like she experienced and other people experience uh, with oxalate dumping. Uh, they might just have, you know, a few bad days you know, or a bad week or two, and then it sort of gets better. And then that's sort of, you know, got them through that. Or every now and then they sort of have a, a bit of a, of a gross period. And then it, and it just sort of resolves. She said a lot of people will do that. Um, and, um, you know, and some people have a more, more serious reaction to it. And so for people that are having a more serious reaction and you've troubleshot all the other things and you know, you need to think about that and you need to go look at Sally Norton's protocol on how to, uh, how to deal with that, you know, because that can be pretty nasty, you know, and I've, I've spoken to people that had a really rough time for like six months and, uh, and it was, it was, it was gross and they didn't, they really didn't like it. So, you know, it's, um, it's important to keep that, keep that in mind. So I, I totally agree with that. Thank you for that, David. Um, so yeah, super chat from Kip. Thank you very much. Other than possible mental issues, if I crave things like sauerkraut or pickle juice after eating a whole pack of bacon, is there a vitamin deficiency I could be concerned about? Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, you know, a lot of, a lot of, so look, you know, the, the fermented sort of things, um, you know, are, are going to be less bad, you know, fermenting those vegetables is a traditional way of detoxifying them, not necessarily all the way, but at least to a, a degree, probably a significant degree, and uh, and to free up different nutrients and getting some of those healthy bacteria and things like that. I think your fermented dairy products be just fine, if not better, depending on how you tolerate dairy. Um, craving things like pickles and sauerkraut, um, you know, I don't, I, I think that that might just be more uh, to do with you just enjoying that taste and that flavor and, uh, and sort of, you know, liking that, liking that experience. I, I like pickles, sauerkraut, um, like on a hot dog, you know, I liked that. Um, but I don't, I don't think there's anything in there that you need past the, the meat that you're eating. Um, so I don't, I don't think that it's, uh, from a vitamin deficiency anyway you know maybe you could say something about like electrolytes because there are you know good electrolytes in, in like sauerkraut you know and the juice of of you know pickles and things like that um and sometimes when people are having you know uh, electrolyte issues you just you just slug down <laughs> you know a couple big gulps of of pickle juice and you know seems to help but you know apart from that it, I, I don't think there'd be any vitamins or anything like that that you're missing certainly uh, maybe electrolytes, but you know, you can always just, you can always just take some, some electrolytes without all the other stuff in it as well. And, um, uh, so that's, that's what I would sort of do. You know, Dr. Sean O'Mara really likes ferments, um, either, you know, plant ferments or, um, you know, a dairy ferment to eat, to, to, to basically to restart people's microbiome, right? I think once you've got your microbiome set up, you just keep eating meat and you're going to perpetuate it. Um, and so maybe people early on, you know, because he's treating people that, that, you know, are just doing this de novo, right? They're doing this from scratch. And so, you know, having a bit of ferments with meat that you're eating, you eat it together, you chew it together, you swallow it together, um, that that can, that that can help as well. But, um, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't think you're missing anything though. I don't think you're missing any vitamins or anything like that. Uh, certainly. And uh, so if you're new to this and maybe you know, helping with your gut biome and all that sort of stuff, you know, maybe, but I think you can do just as well, if not better with like fermented dairy. So that's, that's what I would do for the microbiome side of things, um, you know, at first, but no, I don't think you're, you're missing any vitamins anyway. Uh, super chat from Bishop's Deep Learning. Thank you for that. Uh, Jordan Peterson said his wife couldn't tolerate aged meat and her issues only went away when eating non-aged lamb yeah that's that's something that's interesting that's something that um some people talk about you know they blame histamines other people don't think that histamines are a thing but there's something happening there right you're you're aging this and um and you're getting a reaction sometimes they don't or you're you're cooking meat you put it in the fridge you don't you you're fine with it day one day two it's giving you a weird reaction so whatever's happening you know just avoid it Right. Yeah, you know, that's um, you know, that's the, the classic sort of thing. You go to the doctor 
and they say, like, oh, doctor, it hurts when I do this. And the answer is, like, okay, don't do that. <laughs> it's like, stop it. So, so that's the thing. So, you know, if you, if you don't tolerate aged meat, um, and, uh, and you need to eat, you know, sort of, sort of fresher meat or things that haven't been, you know, hung, um, to just sort of, you know, age them and, and, uh, you know, it just sort of helps dry them out a bit, gets a bit better flavor and, um, uh, can be a bit more tender and things like that as well. That's why that's why you you hang meat. But it's um, you know if it's something that's causing you a problem, just avoid it. You know, just eat eat the meat that that you feel good eating, uh, that makes you feel the best that you can afford, and uh, and that's it. You know, and if you're if you're doing well with you know non aged lamb, great. And if you're doing great with like I don't have a problem with that one way or the other. Like you know, I, I I'll make a I'll age my meat. I'll uh, age it, wet age it, dry age it, you know, put a brisket in and, uh, and I'll just, I'll just be chopping that up and eating that for the rest of the week. I don't have a problem with that. If you do have a problem with that, you know, just, just, you know, do the things that, that don't give you a problem and eat the meat that doesn't give you a problem in the way that it doesn't give you a problem. Uh, but it's still, uh, you know, it's still obviously very important to eat meat and uh, really just exclusively meat, I think. So a question from Carnivore Queendom. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm 32 and have diverticulosis. What are your thoughts on probiotics? I was told to take them every day. Higher fat gives me colon spasms. I'm three weeks into carnivore. Diarrhea is bad. Scared of diverticulitis. Uh, yeah, well, look, it's not going to... Eating meat, eating carnivore diet is not going to cause diverticulitis. Full stop, right? You know, it, you may develop it, but it's not going to be a, a product of a carnivore diet. Generally, it's from eating a bunch of fiber and seeds and garbage that gets stuck in those little diverticulae and, and can cause a little a micro, you know, fiber causes micro abrasions and you can allow bacteria to get in and, and you know, uh, seed and infection. So, um, no, I think, I think you'll, you'll be fine. Uh, the diarrhea being bad, those are, that's from a few different things. Uh, one, eating a lot of fat that can cause diarrhea because you're only absorbing a certain amount of fat, then there's going to be spillover. If there's a lot of spillover, then that's going to be diarrhea, right? So it's not just going to be soft. It's going to be liquid uh, in your stools. Another thing to remember is that uh, most people drink coffee. Coffee is a plant. Coffee is something that I recommend people coming off of. Um, a lot of people don't want to do that. <laughs> And so even though going to carnivore diet and they're only eating meat, they're still drinking coffee. And so that is uh, a diuretic or sorry, it is a diuretic, but it's also a laxative. Tea is also a laxative, right? So artificial sweeteners are laxatives. So people are often still using artificial sweeteners and coffee, usually putting the sweeteners in the coffee. And so that's a recipe for, for explosive diarrhea sometimes, especially when you're not eating fiber. So you could be eating, drinking the same amount. Well, I was always, always drank this amount of coffee. I never had diarrhea, right? But you were eating fiber before and fiber is going to just clog up the works. It's going to have this log jam that you're just trying to push through, maybe even just keeping you regular and, and keeping things moving in the first place, you know, with the coffee. Uh, now that log jams out of the way, it's just a deluge, right? So if you are, not drinking well if you're drinking coffee or tea or artificial sweeteners get rid of those right and then see how you're doing if you're if you're not doing that or you're still having diarrhea after you've gotten rid of that then uh, reduce the amount of fat that you're eating okay so you're, you're not absorbing all the fat usually now some people can be so constipated that they actually get a sort of a pseudo obstruction and now you get liquid stools coming around that so you're just getting liquid diarrhea all the time right and then every now and then you get hard, pebbly, dry, very difficult to pass stools. That's called spurious diarrhea or overflow diarrhea, meaning that you're so constipated that you've actually gone the other way. Now you're getting diarrhea, right? So that's a problem. That means you need to eat a lot more fat and um, maybe even take a laxative, try to clear that, that out and then start fresh. Um, and then the other one is, uh, so if that's not the case and you are eating enough fat and you're not getting those you know, that overflow diarrhea, then, then, uh, you can try eating less fat, especially if it's giving you upset, you know, stomach and colon spasms, but also pe some people don't really tolerate rendered fat like tallow, um, or even butter, you know, and then you, so you need like the, the, the actual cellular fat. So the fat that's on the meat and you just eat that and you, and you add in any sort of fat then that can just go, go through a lot quicker. Um, and then some rare, 
instances of, of people actually need to sort of cut off the fat, and eat that uncooked, and they absorb that much better than and then if they cook it, it slightly renders it out and starts that process there. But I would I would just try, you know, stepwise progression going through those things and, and trying those things differently. As to probiotics, um, I, you don't need them. You don't need them on a carnivore diet. Any any probiotics that you need can come from the food that you're eating, such as fermented dairy. You know, like a you know just just plain live culture yogurt, right? Um, and uh, and that and that will that will reseed your your gut biome. But then you know just eating meat will just perpetuate and grow the healthy microbiome that that you you need, right? Probiotics as a product are probably not beneficial. So there's a, there was a recent study that came out that actually showed that taking probiotics, like commercial probiotics, these things have a lot of other you know sugars and crap in it that they're just not good for you. So maybe they have probiotics. Do they even get down to your to your um, the part of your gut? They get past your stomach and the first part of your small intestine that you know is going to just scorch most of the bacteria that go through there. Is it even going to get to it? You know, probably not. And it's going to come with a bunch of sugar and other sorts of crap that you don't want. So it was a study that came out. Uh, recently, there was not a surprise to me showing that actually probiotics actually made things worse. It didn't actually help, right? And that wasn't a surprise to me because I sp had spoken to a gastroenterologist here in Perth who actually did a study for the probiotics companies. Now, they are saying like, oh, it's clinically proven to benefit blah, 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 blah. That clinically proven whatever is a study with six people, right? And it's, like, it's not powered enough strong enough to actually give you any real results and they're like, oh yeah we got these initial good results well that that's that's a good that's a good start that's a good uh, grant proposal say hey we had six people there there's proof of concept why don't we why don't we put some money towards this and do a real study uh when they did the real study they paid a, a guy and a, and a you know place down here in, in perth to uh do that study and look at probiotics and they found that actually it was, it was detrimental and they were getting ready to publish that and they got a letter from the lawyers uh, from the company saying that you, you publish that we're going to sue you and we're going to take you out and because it's like they paid for it it's their research and you're not allowed to use it unless they want you to and so that got buried so the abstract's available but the study itself is was not allowed to be pu published and then so you know you have this other one that did get published and it's just like okay well that that just told told us what we already knew but weren't allowed to say and weren't allowed to publish because that's a lot of industry research is uh, if it doesn't show what they wanted to show, if it doesn't support their product, it just doesn't get published, right? And it's the industries that do the majority, the vast majority of the nutritional studies and the studies on their own products, certainly. So it's a very skewed, oh, well, there's a study that says that, couldn't care less. You have to look at what the source is and you have to, and sometimes they don't even disclose that, that it's industry funded, which is, you know, is illegal and unethical, but that's happened. That happened with all the, the sugar and uh, cholesterol researchers. They were not saying that they were getting paid by the sugar companies and that their, their research was being funded by the sugar companies. And, uh, but we, we found that out subsequently. Uh, super chat from tiger voodoo mom. Thank you very much. I have, I have caused disease and pyoderma gangrenosum in carnivore for six months recently developed hives is this related to carnivore um after six months probably not you know there are some people that can develop like urticaria early on especially and um for some reason like people doing like keto or carnivore or something like that they can they can develop these sorts of rashes um and i was i was reminded of that also you know the last uh live that we did someone had a, had a problem with a rash and i was trying to sort of you know pick my brain on on, on what that could be um and a dermatologist from from canada uh emailed me and and um uh, you know, very kindly sort of reminded me that actually it's something that he saw as well. He's been doing keto for a while and he, he gets his patients on it as well, which is, I think is great. Just more and more uh, doctors doing this and getting their patients, uh, you know, healing themselves, especially in derm dermatology. There's so many dermatological issues that uh, can be benefited through through nutrition and proper nutrition. And he reminded me that, that this is something that he's seen. He's seen this urticaria and uh, people developing hives and things like that for some damn reason. Um, you know, and, and they could possibly be uh, detoxifying, right? So you're, you're getting, you know, all these different sorts of toxins and things like that, and your body's sort of reacting weirdly to it. Could be that there's like fat-soluble uh, toxins. Um, 
what is that dioxin stuff that's sort of fat soluble and people worry about like oh i've been exposed to this stuff should i worry about when i lose fat maybe you know you might react to that so that could potentially be that you're losing fat and that's releasing some of these toxins that have been sequestered there and your body's reacting to it um i would obviously look at everything else. Are you being exposed to anything else? Is there anything in your environment or in your food or whatever that could be causing a reaction, right? If not, then, you know, then it, it could possibly be that your body's releasing these different toxins. You'll get through that. We might need to take some, uh, you know, antihistamines and, and get, uh, you know, some help, you know, if, if it gets too much, because obviously you're getting high as you get that in your mouth, it gets in your throat, you get sort of swelling in your throat. You, that, that's actually life-threatening, right? So you need to, you, you need to sort of take things and, and be ca careful about that and make sure that, that that's not causing a problem. So, you know, things like antihistamines and so on, uh, but also just make sure you're not being exposed to anything. And, um, uh, eliminating that as a possibility as well. So question from uh, Kit. Thank you very much for the super chat. I read that alpha gal syndrome allergy to red meat has become a serious health risk in the US. Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, so that that's the, sort of that, that lone star tick um, issue, right? So that's as alpha gal, you get, you start getting cross reactivity to the little whatever spit toxins poison whatever that's coming from the tick and uh, you develop antibodies towards that which then react to certain carbohydrates on certain meats like red meats but um you can eat other meats so you can still do carnivore and um and from what i understand from people i've spoken to it actually is temporary so after you know sort of three to six months it goes away which it was really big relief for me because I was looking at that. I was just like, I would finally, you know, uh, found carnivore again. I've been feeling better than I had in my entire life. And all of a sudden there's just like, Lone Star Tick makes you allergic to meat. I'm like, no, that can't happen. I can't have that. Nope. <laughs> and and um, I'm not, I'm not going back. I'm not going back to eating that crap. You know, I'm, not, I'm just not, I'm just not going to I'm like, what the hell am I going to do? And so I was just, I was desperate to never be exposed to that. And then, so I came to Australia. I was like, oh, okay, that's good. And they're like, oh yeah, Lone Star Tick is showing up in, in Australia. They're getting some of the alpha gals. And I'm like, no, no, what the hell? You know, this thing's following me. And, um, but yeah, from, 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 um, people I've spoken to, it doesn't last forever. You know, it's just sort of like three months or so and, uh, and you'll be back. And, uh, and you can also eat the other meats, you know, so you just, you just eat other meats, uh, while you're doing that. And then after sort of three months, six months or whatever, you can, you can try, uh, going back to eating red meat as well. And, uh, hopefully, hopefully it goes away. And if not, you just, you're just eating the other meats for the rest of your life, which is less than ideal, but, uh, still a hell of a lot better than the alternative. Pound for pound beast. Thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, thanks for all of your work. I've been carnivore since January 1st. I feel the best I ever have. Went from 236 pounds to 207. That's great. Blood work has improved. Triglycerides lowest ever, but LDL is higher. And my nurse practitioner is concerned. Your thoughts? Uh, yeah, your triglycerides are down. That's that's what you want. So that that's probably more well, that's, that's, that is more telling than whatever your LDL is. Um, you know, you're, there are tons of different kinds of LDL, right? So, um, you know, so you have a whole bunch of different sorts of particulates of LDL. And so you get your LDLP checked. You can, you can see that. And, and if your triglycerides are low and your HDL is high, you're going to have a good, uh, balance of LDLP Your your, your particulate studies are going to be, uh, favorable, very favorable. Um, Again, LDL, total cholesterol, all that sort of stuff. It was just never, ever, ever a marker of disease. In fact, a lot of studies have shown that higher LDL cholesterol um, is, is associated with lower all-cause mortality. People live longer with higher LDL, total LDL. Um, and, uh, and there's other, other studies that have shown even a protective measure of cholesterol with heart disease. So the Framingham study is one of the, I mean, I was taught this in medical school that, and we were taught that the Framingham study showed that more cholesterol equaled more cardiovascular disease and death. In fact, it showed the exact opposite of that, but it was misrepresented by the American Heart Association. So the American Heart Association, uh, you know, published two years after the Framingham study, 
flipping those around. But the actual Framingham study showed that lower levels of cholesterol, you know, every certain amount of, of lowering cholesterol conferred to a corresponding increase in cardiovascular disease and death, right? So this was just never the problem that it ever was. Your triglycerides are going down. That's great, right? HDL is going up. It will with saturated fat and especially with uh, anaerobic exercise, you're, you're going to get better and you're going to get metabolically improved and cardiovascularly optimized as well. Um, so watch my video on the truth about uh, cholesterol and heart disease uh, for, for more on that. But no, I, I don't, I'm, I personally, that is my reading. I have, I have slightly higher LDL than what is considered a normal reference range. Not all that much, but a little higher, but my HDL is sky high. And my triglycerides are super low. My triglyceride, my HDL triglyceride ratio, you know, is three. So my, my HDL is three times that of my triglycerides or so people look at triglycerides to HDL, it's 0.3. Right. So I have three times the amount of HDL as I do triglycerides. So that, that puts me in a very good position and, and very, very low risk of heart disease. I'm not, I'm not going to get heart disease unless something funny happens and some sort of weird exposure that I'm, that I'm not aware of that I'm being exposed to, but it's certainly not going to come from food. So uh, from the food that I'm eating from a carnivore diet. So, um, I would check out that, that video. And, uh, and hopefully that, that reassures you as well. But I mean, look at this, you're improving by every objective metric, right? Your weight's improving, your health is improving, your energy is improving, all your bloods are improving. It's just this one little thing. Oh, LDL is kind of hot. Well, stop it immediately. You know, this one marker is more important than the 9,000 other markers, um, and, and, and obesity and all these sorts of things. That's, that, that's much better to be obese and sick and have all your other bloods out of whack. Than have this one no that's ridiculous again different kinds of ldl even if you had the sdldl bad ldl 1.7 times increased risk of heart disease metabolic syndrome is six times increased risk type 2 diabetes is 10 times the risk smoking is around that as well right so 1.7 is just not making the cut you get rid of 10x 10x and 6x and, and you have 1.7x, but you don't even have 1.7x because you're not going to have the SDLDL. You're going to have the large buoyant LDL. So that's a 0x or a 1x anyway. So uh, I wouldn't, I, I personally, that's my, that's my cholesterol reading. I'm not worried about that for myself anyway. So kick it with Chris and Kristen. Thank you very much for the super chat. Been uh, starting carnivore 3.5 weeks ago. I took a magnesium supplement. I have since stopped because um, it's in my electrolytes, but now having major leg cramps. Should I add it back in? Don't want to overtake vitamins. So uh, it depends. You know, if you're if you're taking uh, caffeine, tea, or coffee, you're going to strip magnesium out of your body. You're also going to dehydrate yourself. Perfect recipe for uh, leg cramps, right? Um, most, if you're not doing that, if you're just eating fatty meat and drinking water, um, you know, then, then that likely won't be an issue, uh, especially if you've caught up and you have normal levels of magnesium, you've been taking supplements before and, uh, aren't in a deficient state, then that should be fine. Most often it's dehydration. Most often it's not electrolytes because a lot of people will get, leg cramps and they're taking electrolytes. They're taking the LMNT and all that sort of stuff and they're still getting there. Oh my God, I'm taking all these electrolytes. Do I just take more? Like whatever, what do, what do I do? Drink more water. You know, if you're taking electrolytes and you're, and you're getting cramps, well, it's not from the electrolytes then, right? Because you, you've already covered that base. And so you just, just drink more water. And that's generally what it is. If you're drinking coffee, yes, add it, add a magnesium, you know, and stop coffee if you can, or, you know, caffeine and tea and all that sort of stuff. If you're not doing any of that, drink more water. See if that helps. You know, if you if you need, if, I mean, low magnesium can cause cramps. But you know, if you had been taking magnesium before and you're not taking things that will strip magnesium out of your body, it's very unlikely to be uh, the magnesium. So you can you can add some magnesium back in, but it's much more often the case that it's dehydration. So I would definitely address that first and foremost and go from there. Super chat from Jeff Berry. Um, I think we already did this one. Six foot one, 300 pounds, 2.5 weeks into carnivore and have lost 
all hunger three days since my last meal, no lost energy and brain power. Should I still keep going for, or force a meal? Uh, yeah, so maybe maybe that was just, <laughs> didn't get to that question uh, quite as quickly as, as he was hoping, just because that was yeah, source <laughs> sent a while ago, like over an hour ago. I mean, I'm a bit behind on the super test. I am trying to work my way through them. Uh, but yeah, I think we did did address that. Um, hopefully you, you heard that answer. Um, because it was, I, I did take take a long time to answer it. But uh, uh, if you didn't, it, you know, just just rewind it back, and um, I did did answer that. But uh, yeah, you should you should try to eat every day and eat until meat stops tasting good, and, and you have to relearn your hunger signals because they're just going to be very very different. It's very very normal to under eat on a carnivore diet. I didn't eat for days at a time until I figured this out, and um, and so it goes by taste. Try eating every day. Eat until meat stops tasting good. And, uh, and just listen to your body after that. And good luck with that. Uh, Dusky505, thank you for the super chat. The purine from uh, the meat causes my right knee to swell. Any suggestions? This is clear over time. Yes, it does. You just need to get rid of all the other things. So generally, you get... Um, you can get like, you know, gout and gouty attacks. There's actually five different causes of gout, not just the uric acid crystals. Oxalates are a cause of gout. They are a known cause of gout in the medical textbooks and literature. Um, and so uh, maybe referred to as pseudo gout now, uh, which is, you know, whatever. You know, people can decide whatever the hell they want to, to name things. But uh, historically, you know, before the 2000s, before the 1990s and the 2000s, uh, there were five causes of gout, not pseudo gout. And sort of just now they've said uric acid crystals is gout. Everything else is pseudo gout, whatever. So um, if you are, but but the gout itself, like uric acid crystals, this, this comes from uh, fructose and alcohol by and large. Okay, so you're going to increase your your uric acid and, and uric acid crystals and all these sorts of things. Also, there's a bit of a, of a weird thing because there, there can be people with very high uric acid levels and they don't get gout. And people that have, you know, sort of low uric acid and they do get gout. So it, there's something else going on there as well. There's a confounding factor that we don't necessarily know about. I think it's probably something in the plants and the sugar that's also contributing to that. But in any case, um, the people that do have gout and have those, those sorts of issues uh some tend to report that it improves but maybe they might have a sort of a gouty attack or a swelling or something like that after the fact but it gets less and it gets less and it gets less as you go and continues to improve so yeah i would stick with it i would cut out everything no artificial sweeteners certainly no sugars no alcohol no coffee tea drink enough water eat enough fatty meat and uh, yes you will you will get through that uh, thank you for the super chat. Sephiroth Cloud. Uh, cousin has type 2 diabetes, no meds, on keto diet, had five times the max ketones on urine, eats more carbs now. Uh, there, there's a way for carnivore ketosis, or is she doing? Uh, yeah, no. So I you're not you're not you're not gonna get dangerous levels of ketones unless you don't have insulin. If you're a type one diabetic, you can go into ketoacidosis, but it's it's ketones high and acidotic blood, right? So your pH is too low, right? And that and that's what causes the problem there. So uh, it's not the ketones, it's the acidosis. And so type two diabetes it's almost impossible to get uh, uh, ketoacidosis unless you're you're completely insulin dependent. Um, but she's not on meds, so she's not in that case. So you really don't see ketoacidosis in type two diabetics. Um, ketones in urine aren't really accurate. Uh, you want to go by the blood uh, ketone levels, and um, uh, but there's 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 honestly it's not a you know those, those that so called maximum is in consideration of people that are on a on a normal diet, right? So a normal standard carb ridden diet and you're a diabetic. Well, oh my God, your ketones are going up. There must be something wrong with the diabetes. No, you're just, you're eating differently. So this, this is a, there's a different reference range for people that aren't eating carbohydrates. And I think that's really the real range, but, um, no, you know, she's feeling fine and everything's going well and her blood ketones are whatever they are. And she's not acidotic and she's not on well, no, she, she'll be fine. And in fact, her, her type 2 diabetes will go away, uh, especially if it's early on like this. So um, I would I would just continue on with, with that. 
you can check blood ketones if you want urine ketones aren't aren't really great but you know the maximums are talking about people that are eating carbohydrates and and that's that so that's very different that's not that's not the same reference ranges so there's really no maximum on your ketones as long as as long as everything else is okay enjoy your life thank you for the super chat which players were the most influential in you pursuing a rugby career? Your favorite current player and prediction on who will win this year's World Cup? That is an excellent question. I have unfortunately not been following <laughs> um, rugby recently. I have just been so snowed under for the last sort of two years with work that I have not actually watched a, a single rugby game, and I hate that. So I don't I don't know anything that's going on. Um, and uh, all blacks are kicking ass. They always kick ass. Um, and uh, from what I hear, a lot of them have been going low carb for the last few years, pushing towards carnivore, like they needed more of a damn advantage. So um, this is something I've been trying to get you know some of my American colleagues to try to, to get on board with. Some of them have, and they've had amazing results as a as, uh, consequence of that. Um, but uh, All Blacks have apparently been doing this for a few years, and it's just uh, you know getting better and better. Players that were influential for me. So I came I came to rugby in a, sort of a different way because I, I didn't grow up watching rugby on TV. I never saw a rugby game. The first rugby game I ever saw was the, first, was the game I played in, my first game. And uh, I had no idea what was going on. And so the people that were influential for me playing rugby were my friends who got me into rugby. So you know, my best friend growing up, Jonathan Gray, uh, good friend uh, Johnny Rogers, um, they joined the wrestling team. And I wrestled since I was a kid. That was that was my main sport, that and uh, MMA. I did uh, pancreation and, and Muay Thai kickboxing since I was 14. I wrestled before that. And um, they joined the wrestling team. And um, because I started, I, I started going to university when I was 16. But I, I would come back for, um, I would come back for uh, sports. And so I met them during that during that wrestling season. And they joined the wrestling team because we had a, we had a nationally ranked. Uh, high school rugby team, uh, not at our school, but as, as a club around there. So um, it was, you know, a group of high schools all all played um, on the same team. And uh, we would get second or third in the nation every year. You know, we're state champs every year, second or third in the nation every year at the national championships. So, you know, that, um, you know, they took it very seriously. So a lot of the rugby players joined the wrestling team because that was directly before also a lot of crossover a lot of crossover skills uh from wrestling and, uh, to rugby a lot you know body position you know being able to manhandle other people uh, uh double leg takedown is a rugby tackle it's perfect form and technique and you're going in there you're shooting bam hit them up hit them in the hips pick them up slam them you could do that back then so much fun can't do that anymore it's uh i don't know i think it's it's uh we've lost something there guys but it uh, you could do it then, and then so I was it. it was just double leg, bam, hit in, pick them up, wham, slam them into the ground. Uh, that was great. That was a lot of fun. So they were they were the most influential for me. So they were, um, you know, that those were my motivators. Was was uh, just the the camaraderie that I had on the team, how tight of like a family unit it was on that team. We started playing for the, the men's team as well, and these just, these all just became my best friends you know, and, and still are, you know? And so, you know, that was, that was what was highly motivating for me was just that, that how close everyone was, the camaraderie, um, for the, for the sport. And, uh, and that, that just made me want to play and play and play and play. And, um, and that's what made me so passionate about it. I, I was uh, passionate about the game as a player. I loved playing the game. I didn't grow up watching it. It was so difficult to watch a rugby game in America for years, you know, that like you just, you just couldn't get rugby games. It was very difficult. You know, you had to, it was some sort of, uh, you know, cable channels. It was like you had to have some the super high end sports package, international sports package. Generally people weren't getting that at their house. Uh, we certainly didn't have it growing up and, you know, um, and so, you know, maybe you'd have it like at a bar or something like that. So some bar would have like an all blacks game or whatever. And, uh, but it would be at two in the morning, you know, or four in the morning or something like that. So you'd like, you'd set your alarm, you'd wake up and you'd go there with a rugby team and you just watch this game. And, um, so, you know, sometimes we'd watch the Eagles play and I had friends on the Eagles, you know, uh, you know, since, you know, I was all American and, you know, a couple of guys, um, on that, 
all American team, high school American team were, you know, you know, on the Eagles shortly after that. And, you know, so we wanted to watch them and watch them play. And that's what we had to do. So, you know, I was always a, a fan of playing the game. I never really, you know, got into being a fan of, of watching the game, but I love watching obviously. Uh, but I love playing more. And so I'm, I'm actually planning on going to the world cup this year um, in France with, you know, the guy who got me into rugby in the first place, uh, my buddy Johnny Gray, and um, and that's going to be awesome. And uh, really looking forward to that as well. So, so thank you very much for the super chat, Jason. Uh, Jason Harris, fifty four years old, uh, carnivore since um, four one twenty three. So depending on the part of the world you are in, that's either. Uh, April the 1st or uh, the 4th of January. <laughs> For some reason, they just flip it in, uh, in different areas. Ox TPAP down 36 pounds, blood pressure normal. That's great. Question, how do you feel about dry sauna, bathing, and or cryotherapy for brown fat stimulation and HGH? Uh, well, from from what I've seen, I haven't, I haven't looked too closely into it, but speaking to people like uh, you know Professor Ben Bickman and so on, uh, certainly with that cryotherapy, uh, he, he's all for it. And you know, he says that you can actually increase your thyroid hormone by like 50%. You, know, you produce this from your brown fat. And, um, you know, and other things I've seen, you know, people are saying that you can increase your HGH and testosterone and things like that. And then um, by uh, doing, you know, cold and heat, cold and heat, going back and forth and all these sorts of things. So I, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's, you know, there are some uh, preliminary benefits. We don't have necessarily, uh, you know, bigger studies on that showing exactly what this is going to do for you. But there's some very interesting and very promising, uh, you know, results on that. So I think it's I think it's worth it, you know, to to try, especially if you enjoy it. I mean, I like the sauna, the dry sauna bathing is great. You know, it's really nice. And then hopping in some frigid cold water it's just sort of exhilarating sort of fun you know you do that with your you know uh, you know a friend or friends or whatever and you're just sort of talking and hanging out and just going back and forth and doing that it can be fun so you know if that and that's something that you know in scandinavia they've done for god knows how long you know centuries at least millennia probably going from a hot dry sauna jumping into a frozen lake and coming back out again God knows if that's what you want to do. Actually, I just spoke with someone as well. It was a, it was a bit of a, of a history buff. And they said that um, uh, Augustus Caesar, uh, you know, the Julius Caesar's nephew who then took over after he was assassinated and there was a whole big coup and, and uh, you know, and, and war on who on, of succession between like, you know, Mark Antony and, and uh, Augustus and uh, probably another faction as well. But, uh, Augustus ended up winning. Apparently, he had horrible arthritis and had a lot of pains and things like that. And uh, one of one of the things that his doctors did was actually do hot cold therapy. You get into this sauna. And he has his own private bath, so we go from hot to cold and hot to cold. Apparently, that really helped. So that's got about two thousand years of history to it. You know, and the Scandinavians have been doing that for however long they've been doing it too. So uh, I look. I think there's probably something there. You know, there's certainly uh, Dr. Bickman thinks there's definitely something there. Uh, I, I, uh, I believe that, um, you know, there's, there's enough there that it's at least worth a shot, especially if you enjoy it. And if that's something that you enjoy doing, you know, might as well. Mr. Smelly Potato, uh, thank you for the super chat. How much salt is too little on a carnivore diet and how much is too much? And do you need more if you are active outdoors? So too little is zero um is is lower than zero so um i don't i don't really use salt anymore uh, i've just used less and less and less salt i've basically stopped using salt now meat tastes fine you know without salt it gets a bit you know it's a bit bland at first but i've just sort of naturally just used a bit less and a bit less and a bit less the only salt that i'll have on on meat is if it's something that i buy from somewhere else you know and um might have a bit of salt in it. i don't add salt anymore at all actually um, and I, I, I do just fine with that. There are a lot of long-term carnivores that, that's, you know, that swear by not using salt and not using it. So they think it's addictive and problematic in a number of different ways. 
As far as too much, that's going to be very individual. So if you're salty to taste, generally you'll be fine. There are about 20% of people that are a bit more salt sensitive and that may affect sort of blood pressure issues. Generally, when they're insulin resistant and they have uh, and they're eating, you know, carbs and sugar and things like that as well. So if you're on a carnivore diet and you're salting to taste, you usually don't have a problem. And generally, if you're if you eat more than salt than that, you're just going to increase your thirst and you're going to drink more water and you're going to eventually pee this stuff out and it'll sort of take care of itself. Um, there are some people with some blood pressure issues. So, you know, just thinking back to that one uh, question that, that we had about uh, from that lady saying that she like three months into a carnivore diet, she started having blood pressure issues. Quite strange. Um, potentially an issue with salt. She might be one of those, those rare few people that uh, are actually quite salt sensitive, very rare, but um, she could be, she could be one of the lucky few. So, you know, that could be something you, you could try doing is, is reducing or eliminating salt. Most people, by and large, you can salt to taste, drink to thirst, and you'll be fine. Um, you don't need any salt. You don't need any salt. If you're converting from standard carb-ridden, you know, diet to a ketogenic diet, like a carnivore diet, there can be a bit of a, of a, of a flux where your insulin is coming down low and your body sort of adjusting to that lack of insulin for uh, electrolyte reabsorption in your kidneys. And so, but your body will adjust. I think your body is adjusted first to that, that insulin and getting that, um, getting that insulin level, you know, uh, up higher than it should be up higher than your body wants it to be. And then your body's adjusted for that. Now the insulin is going back down, your body can sort of go back to normal and it will, you know, it just might be a bit of a, of a lag. And, uh, and if there is fine, that's all right. Use a bit of salt, salt to taste, have some electrolytes and things like that. After a few weeks, you should be fine and you shouldn't have an issue with electrolytes. Uh, super chat from uh, Fife Bear. Thank you very much uh, for that. Since uh, December 23rd, 22, I have reduced my stomach circumference by 11.8%. Fantastic. So, uh, by, by waist size, I'm I'm, uh, I'm guessing, uh, from 42.5 to 37.5, which is great. Uh, weight has dropped from 245 to 207. Fantastic. And using uh, the U.S. Navy algorithm of being six foot tall, around 27% body fat to around 19% body fat by eating a ton of steak. Thanks for your information. That's awesome. So thank you very much uh, for letting us know. That's really great. And it, and it helps other people. Uh, see that and go like, okay, you know, that's, those are the results that people are getting. Uh, you've been doing this, you know, for almost two years now and people say, Oh, well, what if you're doing it for too long? Well, I've been doing it for nearly six years. It'd be six years in February. And, um, and, uh, and then we have another one here that's having great results. So thank you very much for that. That's, uh, that's awesome. I'm really glad to see that you're doing so well and uh, you know, just keep it up. You know, the more you do this, the, the better your health gets, and, you know, it just, it just keeps getting better and better. A lot of these things take a long time to get out of your system. Uh, one person uh, that I was talking to, they said that, that seed oils can actually uh, have stay in your system for a long time, you know, the linoleic acid and the omega sixes and all these sorts of things. They can actually, they have, have like a, like a four year half-life, which is crazy. So, you know, I'm, I'm not, I, I haven't even gotten everything out of my system yet. So, you know, it's just actually almost pretty great because you're just thinking, Hey, you're just going to keep getting better. Just going to keep getting better and better and better as we go. So, uh, that's great. Thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you for the super chat colors. Um, is the X3, X3 bar, the, the, the banded weightlifting, uh, uh, stuff, uh, is one set to failure good for building muscle, any science behind one set? Well, there's, there's a lot actually, uh, and Dr. Jayquish who, you know, makes the, the X3, he, he posts a lot about that on his, uh, Instagram. He, he's got a pretty big ins Instagram account. Sorry, my cat's sort of coming through. <laughs> I can see his tail. Um, you know, he, he actually publishes a lot of that. And, and, um, so he'll have a lot of stuff on his website on the X3 bar website and uh, on his Instagram, he talks about that as well. And he'll, and he'll re reference different studies and specifically ones on one set to failure. That This is, um, is definitely more than enough, uh, to trigger, you know, uh, stimulation of, of, of muscle growth. It has to be to failure though. 
right? You need to, you know, just sort of go like, oh yeah, that that's good enough. You, you need to go until your body can't go anymore. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things, you know, because what was, I think it was what Mike Metzger or something like that. He, I think that was him, uh, you know, big professional bodybuilder, big dude. And he would say, you know, it's like all these guys are working out for four hours a day, you know, thought more was better, but he's just like, you know, I, I may obtain that obtained and, and maintained that physique that I had it was a world-class physique by, you know, uh, you know, four 30 minute sessions a week, you know, just got in, got out, you know, he didn't go did 93 sets to failure or whatever. Um, so there's, there's going to be diminishing returns. Like, I mean, I've done 20 sets of bench. I've done 32 sets of squats. Um, and yeah, I was getting, I was getting very jacked. <laughs> I was getting very muscular. Would I have gotten close to the same amount? Um, just doing, you know, a few sets to failure. I don't know, but the, um, but, uh, you know, I probably would have gotten close because it's not like I, I got, you know, extricably more Jack than I've ever been in my entire life. You know, I've, I've been able to get very muscular and very bulky. Um, and that was certainly no exception. I was, I was very, very, very lean and muscular when I was working out for like four hours a day, just lifting weights for four hours a day. And I enjoyed it, you know? And so I, I you know, I was just listening to books on tape and, and different things that I like to listen to anyway. And I was just sort of my escape. Um, but, uh, Jake, which does talk about that. And he has, he has, um, posted about studies that actually show that that one set to failure especially with the variable resistance which is what the x3 bar is so you know as farther you push out the harder it gets and so you just go that to, to failure and it it uh, it does seem to do the job and, and you sort of get diminishing certainly get diminishing returns after that you know and so uh so he he definitely thinks that that doing that every other day is is more than enough and uh, but yeah you should the, the x3 website should have those and and jake wish um dr jake wishes um instagram and social media he posts about that a lot and so he'll have he'll have a lot of those studies available there so you can check out and you know also check it out you know because if uh you know you may not be all that impressed by the data you may not be or, or impressed by that study because a study is just a representation of reality right so you're trying to study reality and try to figure out what works and what's going on and you could look at that and just go mm, yeah i'm not i'm not really convinced that's okay um but those 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 studies are available uh and jake which pushed those out he's been convinced by it and um and so that's what he's going off of and that's where why where the recommendation for the one set to, to failure on the x3 comes from uh, but you can check those out yourself and see what you think uh janet just a super sticker thank you very much i really appreciate that eloya thank you very much for the super chat I'm six months uh, of beef, butter, bacon, and no eggs. Felt off in June, had blood work, um, hemoglobin 48.2 or hemo, hemo, six, oh, so hemoglobin, I was going to say that's 16.1. Um, and RBC is uh, 5.45, folate 2.0, magnesium 2.7, BUN 23. Was normal range in February, um, and then started kidney issues, electrolyte overuse. See doctor in three weeks. Um, well, it, it also depends on the units and um, and what part of the world you're in, um, because it's you know use different different numbers and ratios and things like that. Um, so depending on where you are, your folate could be a little low, um, and if that's if that's the case, then uh, just add in a bit of liver and that could be helpful. Um, you shouldn't have any kidney issues on, on a carnivore diet. Now your BUN, so this is, this is, this is a bit different. So when you look at like your urea, you look at urea that can go up and that's not necessarily an indicator that your kidneys are, are not able to clear urea. And then that's a problem because you look at your creatinine. If your creatinine is normal, your kidneys are fine. If your creatinine is up a bit, you're probably just dehydrated. That's the most common, commonly uh, um, reason for elevated creatinine. Or if you are having kidney issues and your creatinine goes up, well, you, the, the fix is still to drink more water, right? So if your creatinine is, is up a bit, drink more water, see what happens there. That's not necessarily going to affect your urea, 
right? So that's independent. And um, eating more meat, eating more protein, bioavailable protein, healthy protein from meat is going to generally increase your urea, not uric acid, urea. And that is um, uh, actually beneficial because urea is one of our strongest antioxidants. And so having a bit more of that is actually good, you know, as we would say, oh, you need all these antioxidants from plants and things like that. Well, no, actually you don't because you're getting more urea and urea is a better antioxidant. And also those antioxidants in plants come with oxidants and they have a lot more oxidants than they have antioxidants, right? And so, you know, that's, that's not going to be an overall benefit necessarily, necessarily, obviously, you know, speaking generally, but you're getting rid of all the, the oxidative stress and the increased inflammation from different sorts of plants, and you're increasing your urea, which increases your uh, antioxidant load as well. So that's not kidney dysfunction. In fact, more protein um, has, has been shown to improve kidney function. The idea that more protein damages kidney function, that is a myth that just needs to die and is just, just still slowly gasping for, for air, but it's, it's, it's on its way out because it's just, that's what the, the studies and evidence show is that, uh, more, more protein is actually better. So, um, it, it's hard, it's hard to, to know about the magnesium if that's, if that's low, you know, um, it doesn't look low if it's if it's in the numbers of you know here um in australia and things like that that's that's fine the magnesium level is fine it's actually ideal um folate you know if that's a little low then just then just have some some liver and things like that uh but again you know kidney issues aren't, aren't a thing you know drink more water don't worry about your urea um and that's sort of repeat from Elola. Uh, well, well, thank you for that. It's sort of a, a duplicate uh, question there. Um, but yeah, hopefully that answered your question. Uh, Charles Ed, uh, thank you for the super chat. I have an ectomorph body type, but would love to switch to carnivore diet while maintaining a healthy weight as I tend to lose weight quickly and end up scrawny on keto. Any advice? Uh, yeah, just eat enough. So you need to just eat enough fatty meat you need to eat until it stops tasting good and you need to work out so if you want to put on muscle you want to put on lean muscle mass you need to stimulate your body to grow and so you need to to lift weights you need to sprint and that's just very good for you anyway it's very very healthy it's very beneficial to your health and longevity uh by exercising and and exercising in that way and then you just have to eat enough so you have again your hunger signals are going to be very different you're going to tend to under eat because you're just not going to feel as hungry. You need to eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. Try eating at least twice a day. See how you go. Relearn your hunger signals. As long as you're eating enough, uh, you you should be able. You'll lose fat, lose water weight. You know, you may just be a, a slender guy, uh, and that's fine. But you're not going to just keep losing weight, and you're not going to lose muscle mass or anything like that if you are eating enough. Now, you might have intramuscular fat or a bunch of glycogen and water weight, just, you know, it's called myosteatosis, the fat, intramuscular fat. Uh, that's not good. That will get rid of that. So maybe you look less bulky, right? It's like, you know, bodybuilders that sort of bulk up and bulk up and then they, you know, you know stop eating all that crap and all of a sudden their muscles shrink down. They're like, oh, they lost all this muscle mass. No, they didn't. They lost fat, glycogen, and water weight. They did not lose muscle mass or they, they probably didn't if they're eating enough you know, protein and meat and things like that. Um, and so, you know, you're, you might lose a bit of size, but that's, you know, and, and weight, but that's unhealthy weight and unhealthy size if you're eating enough meat, All right? So eat enough meat and work out and, and you'll be fine. And then you'll get down to whatever your base of healthy, lean body mass is. And then you can build up from there and you just lift weights and sprint and, uh, and build up a, a healthy physique from there. Uh, Kane, thank you very much uh, for the super chat. I really appreciate it. Or for the super sticker. Uh, Atomic, thank you for the super chat. Uh, hey, Anthony, was wondering if you've seen people completely reverse histamine intolerance. Can't have slow cooked meat leftovers without problems. Um, yeah, that's, that's, you know, 
sort of jury's out on that one. I, you know, most people that I've spoken to that have those issues and we just talk about it is just say, Hey, just avoid those things. And they just tend to avoid those things. They just haven't come back to them. So I don't know if in the future they, uh, they are able to come back to it, but you know, uh, possibly not. I, I don't know one way or the other. Unfortunately, I haven't, haven't, haven't seen that. I haven't seen people come back to it and, and say, Oh, it's good. It's just usually people have a problem with it and they, they tend to keep having a problem with it but it could be that they're just avoiding it as well. So can't have slow cooked meat or leftovers without problems. So at least avoid it for now. And uh, then in a few months, come back to it and see if it, if, if it's okay and a little better for you. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, do try and avoid it and let your body sort of, um, you know, get accustomed to just being sort of healthy and happy. And, um, and, and, you know, and if that's just how you sort of need to go about it, then, you know, then it is, but, uh, you know, you can try to get in a few months, but I, I would give it like three months anyway, and just and see how you go after that and try it sample back in, you know, every few months, you can just sort of try it. And eventually, you know, it might be better, but I haven't, I haven't seen that yet anyway. But at the same time, um, I don't know anyone who's actually tried sampling it back in specifically like that in that pattern. You know, I know that that people like Michaela Peterson say that, that uh, they really, she really can't have that sort of stuff. Uh, as much. And so presumably, you know, she's been doing this for over five years. So uh, presumably that's, you know, a, um, you know, an ongoing thing for her. So, you know, we'll see, but see how, see how it affects you. And that's the main thing is how, what it does for you. Uh, Scott uh, Zelazny, thank you very much for the super chat. Can you go over why carnivore heals the gut and helps our joints? Oh yeah. So uh, quite easily, you know, you're just you're just re removing the things that are damaging your gut and causing inflammation and hurting your joints, right? So there are, you know, there are a lot of things in plants and you know, like gluten and other sorts of things that cause leaky gut, cause you know, gut dysbiosis and uh, different, you know, you know, bad sort of uh, complement of microbiome uh, in your, of your microbiome and uh, can damage your gut line and cause a bunch of uh, distress and leaky gut and things getting in your gut that you don't want uh, with our, you know, with your joints. Uh, you can get rid of oxalates. The oxalates can cause joint pain. Um, arthritis obviously can cause joint pain. Just inflammation in general can cause uh, pain and distress in your muscles or your joints. Having higher ketones will suppress inflammation, right? You'll feel better. And not eating all of those pro-inflammatory things will obviously make you feel better too because you're not you're not having those and then you have a lot of like you know sugar and glycative stress this can actually damage your cartilage and cause arthritis and there were studies uh, i'll be releasing a, a video with uh dr gary fett he's an orthopedic surgeon and he, he goes over some of the studies showing that actually like arthritis in the knees and things like that um when you, when you look at it it's actually very damaged from sugar and glycation and fructose and things like that and so you know that it can be a major contributor to knee pain and uh, joint dysfunction and damage to the to the to the cartilage. So that's something to uh, to think about as well. So you're just you're just removing all these things that are damaging your body. They're causing inflammation, causing stress, causing pain, causing uh, discomfort, causing damage to your gut, and you're just giving your body what it needs. You're giving your body exactly what it needs and nothing else, and none of the other stuff that can cause harm. So your body just gets on with it and that can suppress inflammation or, or, or prevent it from even starting in the first place. And, um, and that's, uh, but yeah, that's it. So you're getting rid of things that are bad for you and you're giving your body things that are, that are necessary to heal and remove, uh, stress and inflammation. So that's how that helps. That has, that's how it helps most things. In fact, FMK, thank you very much for the super chat. Question. Hi, Dr. Chafee. In your view, would limited amounts of plant products on occasion be fine to take for medicinal purposes, um, e.g. ashwagandha? No idea what that is. But, um, you know, look, using things medicinally is one thing, but just remember, you know, you don't take you don't take antibiotics every day because they're good for treating bacteria, right? They say like, well, you know, um, uh, you know, garlic has a natural antibiotic. And so you should take that every day. It's like, do you have a bacterial infection? Well, you have a microbiome, you have an oral biome. Why are you killing your healthy bacteria? You actually have trillions of tr many, many trillions of, of bacteria that are actually really good and really important for you. Um, you don't want to take a bunch of antibiotics. 
You know, you don't want to take those things. Uh, even when you have an, a bacterial infection, you know, you can really screw up your microbiome. So you're taking something that has antimicrobial effects. That's part of the defense mechanisms of that plant, potentially, or it's just defending itself uh, from bacteria. But you know, you're eating that and, and then that causes, you know, gut dysbiosis. And that can damage you and, and cause pain and distress and discomfort. And you're just, Oof, not eating that crap again. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's not what you want to do. Yeah, so using things medicinally, right? You know, so, so uh, you know, was it U bark? Is it? Yeah, or willow bark. Yeah, um, not U bark. U bark is horribly poisonous. Um, but willow bark has uh, aspirin in it, right? So, you know, that can be fine analgesia and um you know help in, in certain circumstances but you know you wouldn't you wouldn't take that every day for no reason right um i don't know what ashwagandha does but you know again going back to the the uh digitalis example with foxglove maybe you want digitalis but what's the dose what are you getting out of the foxglove and what about the other 150,000 other things that are in foxglove as well or the ashwagandha maybe there's something in there that you want but there are a lot of things that you don't want and you don't know the exact dose that you're getting, which is very important in medicine. So generally, uh, you know, how I, you know, what I recommend is, is if you need medicine, get medicine, get actual medicine in the pill that, uh, you know, that, that still is a good thing. You know I mean? There's a lot of superfluous medications that we don't need that are being pushed for chronic situations that are much better addressed through diet and lifestyle, really just diet um, for the most part. Um, and, uh, we don't need these pharmaceuticals, but there's some pharmaceuticals that help like antibiotics. I'm a fan of antibiotics. I prescribe people antibiotics when, when it's necessary, right? So someone has a post-operative infection or some sort of issue, we give them antibiotics, you know, and, um, we give them antibiotics, you know, before we do surgery, because this significantly reduces the risk of a post-operative infection as well. If you give it, you know, within a certain time period before, before operating. Okay. So that's what I would do. If you, if you need to take medicine, I would take medicine. I would still try to avoid plants. Yeah. Look, if you're, if you're using plants on occasion, if you're using medicine on occasion and it's giving you more of a benefit than harm for that specific circumstance, great. You know, it's on balance doing you good. But of course, you know, if you don't have that issue, it's only giving you the harmful effects. You're not getting any of the benefits. So obviously you wouldn't want to do it then. Uh, but infrequently on occasion, you know, if you need it and you don't have a better option, sure, absolutely. Uh, thank you for Super Chat, Spencer. So Spencer Schwartz uh, says, hi, Doc. Thank you for your work. Beef and salt for 11 days now and started experiencing heartburn in the last two days. Uh, today was uncomfortable enough that I needed to drink milk to soothe. Um, uh, what are your thoughts? So, yeah, that is interesting. Um, generally, it goes the other way. Um, I've, I've come across a couple people that have, have gotten some heartburn uh, developing, but it's, it's usually is almost always the other way around. Usually people have heartburn and gastroesophageal reflux and, uh, and a carnivore diet helps that or a keto diet helps that. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for that. But, um, you know, a lot of it is just removing a lot of the things that are precipitating, you know, that, that sort of problem. Um, you know, if you're only on beef and salt and just water, then, you know, then I don't think it's anything necessarily to do with, with what you're eating could just be something that your body's going through. And, you know, there's, there are a lot of different sorts of changes and transient things like, you know, re releasing different sorts of toxins and losing weight and doing those sorts of things that can affect your body in weird ways, especially in the first sort of few weeks, but can, can happen later as well. And, and we don't know exactly what, what the hell is going on. Um, but they, they tend to pass, you know, having a bit of milk, you know, if that's helping or, you know, some, some unsweetened tums or something like that, if that's helping, you know, then great. You know, it should be something if you're only eating meat and water and no coffee or tea or artificial sweeteners or anything like that, you know, it should be something that, that will pass and, uh, and you shouldn't have a continued problem with. So, you know, just do what you need to do, sort of get through that. And, and hopefully it sort of settles down because that's, that's quite uncommon, and I, I wouldn't expect that to continue. There's nothing in meat that should cause heartburn. So, so hopefully, that, so that probably just something, some temporary sort of strangeness that's that's happening that uh, will go away. So, hopefully, it does. Um, 
Okay. Uh, question from David. Thank you very much uh, for the super chat. Thanks so much, Dr. Chafee. Uh, good night. We'll continue tomorrow. I uh, got to go to bed. Uh, you're the best. Uh, hope to meet you in person one day. Well, thank you very much, David. Yeah, well, that'll be a pleasure uh, to meet you. I will be actually at a few conferences coming up. So if people want to go to those, I'll be in Albury uh, next weekend, actually, uh, giving a talk there. And um, that, that's in New South Wales. And that's the regenerative, the regenerate uh, conference. And um, talking about you know, carnivore and nutrition and regenerative farming and agriculture and things like that. And then uh, two weeks, I'll be in San Diego two, three weeks ish. I'll be in San Diego. And, um, uh, that's for the, uh, the metabolic health symposium. Uh, they're also called, you know, low carb San Diego as, it, as uh, it's also called. And, um, and I'll be giving a lecture on, um, uh, brain cancer and ketogenic metabolic therapy and, and, uh, how we can use that, uh, to hopefully help people. And so if people are down in San Diego, I'll be at that conference between the 17th and the 20th. And so it'd be great to meet people uh, while I'm there. And uh, thanks for, for joining and, and hopefully you uh, catch the rest of this and, and enjoy that too. Thanks a lot, David. Uh, super chat from the solar flare. Thank you very much. What is the right amount of protein grams per day on carnivore? I'm 51 and 240 pound male. I'm starting with this program and I'm concerned if I would be eating too much protein and having it turn into glucose. Oh, mad. Uh, don't worry about that. You know, you, you know, maybe some of it turns into glucose. Uh, gluconeogenesis is, is, is demand driven. It's not substrate driven. So it's not that you're going to necessarily just like, oh, you have more protein. So you're going to get more glucose and your blood sugar is going to get out of control. That does not happen. You know, maybe there's a, there's a bit of a transient bump, but it's very small. If you're eating, um, protein with carbs, you get a larger spike in your, in your blood sugar for whatever reason, but it, uh, it doesn't happen as much when you're not eating carbs. If you're just, if you're just doing a carnivore diet, um, I eat once a day, I eat two pounds of meat in one go. And, um, you know, my body does what it does. My HbA1c is low and uh, I feel great. And I have constant energy throughout the day and night and weekends and all that sort of stuff. So I wouldn't worry about that. Your body knows what it's doing. You know, uh, you know, tigers and lions and koalas, they don't count their macros. They don't pull out calculators to figure out what they're eating and oh, is this how much protein I need and this and the other. They eat what they're supposed to eat and their body does what it's supposed to do. So if your if your blood sugar goes up a bit and you go out of ketosis, you go back into ketosis or whatever, doesn't really matter. Your body's doing what it's supposed to do. If you are eating what you are supposed to eat, and you are doing the things that you're supposed to do, and you're not exposing yourself to other things, um, medications that might disrupt these sorts of things, your body's just going to work the way it's supposed to do. Whether it's in or out of ketosis, transiently or, or whatever, you know, it's as long as you're putting in the right inputs, you're going to get the right outputs, okay? And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that. So um, the amount of grams that you need per day is, is very in individual. Generally, people need around the same amount of grams of fat as protein. But it depends on the person, depends on uh, how much you're working out, depends on how much extra uh, excess adiposity you have, and so on. So, uh, and how nutrient deprived you are because you have vitamins that are in, they're fat soluble and uh, water soluble. So, you're getting things in the fat, in the protein, in the lean, in the fat, and uh, that you need. And so, your body will chase those nutrients more than it will chase calories. And so if your body wants more of those, it's going to need more of those. So I would just eat to hunger, eat to taste. So again, just eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good. Your body knows your body will knows your biochemistry a lot better than we will ever understand our biochemistry. Um, even though we can get all the different processes out there. I mean, there's billions of these ha things happening every second. Like you're just not going to be able to track all of them. You know what? But your body can. So just let it do it. You know, eat what you're supposed to eat. Your body will take care of the rest. Uh, you're not going to damage your kidneys. You're not going to hurt yourself with too much protein. You're not going to, you know, become diabetic or something crazy like that by eating a lot of protein. Um, not going to happen. So just eat as much protein as your body's asking you for. Eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. And your body, your body will sort out the rest. I've never checked my blood sugar. I have never checked my ketones. I couldn't care less what they are because I know they're, they're exactly what they're supposed to be. I'm putting in my body what is supposed to be there my body's going to do with that as it will. And I'm, I'm happy to let it. 
So thank you for the super chat, uh, Patrick. So Patrick Marcel asks, what should I eat to heal uh, middle ear barotrauma? Oof, that's a good question. Is there a type of meat or cut that is superior for cartilage repair? Uh, what about uh, fasting, like uh, dry or water fasting? Uh, yeah, look, so, you know, when, when you have actual trauma, you know, to your body, it may or may not repair, you know, just, just uh, you know, red meat in general is best. Any meat in, in, uh, in general is going to be good. You know, cartilage repair, you want collagen, that's going to come in any meat that you eat. Um, having some bone broth or something like that is going to have a lot of collagen as well, but you'll get plenty of collagen just from, from fatty meat, fatty red meat and, and, uh, you know, eating chicken with a skin on it, all these sorts of things, they will have collagen in it. Um, and you will be able to heal what you're able to heal, but you know, there is such a thing as damage done and, and, you know, the body can't heal from, from every, you know, every you know, insult and damage that we place on it. So just remember that and, um, you know, and focus on the other things as well, because you will get a lot of other benefits as well. It's definitely worth it uh, to do this. And so, you know, just keep going with that. Dry fasting, water fasting, I don't think that's going to help you repair trauma any more than uh, just doing a carnivore diet. The benefits from from fasting really come from just not eating crap. That's basically it. And you're not eating that on a carnivore diet anyway. So, um, you know, I would, uh, I would, um, yeah, just eat meat. You can eat some more sort of cartilaginous meat and, and things like that. And, um, bone broth, things like that. will have a ton of, of, uh, of collagen and all that sort of stuff. And your body will be able to heal what it's able to heal. And hopefully it does, but, but, you know, you have to understand that not everything is going to, is going to heal, you know? So another another question from from Patrick Marcel, uh, thank you very much for that. Is grass fin uh, grass finished fat superior to grain finished? Is grain finished fat toxic? When I eat fatty brisket, I get diarrhea, but not with ribeye. Is that too much fat? Well, it, there is more fat in brisket, and so that could be an issue. But there's also a lot more rendered fat in brisket because you're slow cooking it, and that's cooking out all that tallow basically, and it's going into the rest of the meat. So some people have more of an issue. It just, just goes through their, their system quicker um, if it's not in the actual fat itself. So that could be a problem too. A, yes, it could be more fat, but it also is more rendered fat, which goes through your system quick, quicker. Grass finished fat is superior to grain finished fat uh, in a number of different ways. It's just more nutritious, has more fat soluble vitamins, has a better complement of omega threes versus omega six. And, um, you know, and, uh, you know, there's, there's more, apparently there's more like, you know, branch amino acids and, and grain finished meat as well. That's not the fat, but, you know, it's just sort of interesting, but, you know, so there is, there are different complements and if nutrients in these sorts of things. And if, it, if the animal is eating what it's supposed to eat, it's going to be healthier as a result. And it's going to have better nutrients and nutrition. It's going to be healthier for you as a result. And so, you know, how much of a difference that makes in, in real day to day, uh, life and experience, hard to say. We don't really have any data one way or the other. Grain finished is excellent. Grain finished is better than anything else on earth besides grass finished, right? So if you have access to grain finished and, and you can't really afford or have access or, or obtain grass finished and real grass finished, because a lot of things we call grass fed and aren't or grass finished and aren't, you know, if the fat's not yellow, it's not grain finished or it's not grass finished, right? So it should, the fat should be yellow, right? And so that's, uh, that's real grass fed and finished uh, fat, right? When you do surgery on people, that's yellow. That's not supposed to be white. That's not what it is, right? And so, you know, that that's actually, you know, different nutrients and things like that that just aren't there. And um, so, it's very rare to actually be able to get that that sort of thing, but uh, yeah, it is different. Uh, uh, grain finished fat is not toxic. It is is still excellent for you. Less omega omega threes, maybe more omega sixes, uh, especially if it's been a long time in the feedlots. But um, uh, it's still going to be better than than any alternative. So I wouldn't wouldn't worry too much about it. Uh, another question from Patrick. Thank you very much. What do you think about psilocybin? Can it be good for brain damage, PTSD, depression, 
um, or is it just bad for your brain? Lion's mane has helped my brain. Well, look, there are there are studies showing that that uh, psilocybin can actually help in PTSD, depression, and um, even in people with terminal diseases, terminal illnesses. Uh, apparently, there was one. Uh, I was actually, you know, just from from uh, something Jordan Peterson said. He said there was a study showing that just one dose of psilocybin completely got rid of all the the you know fear and stress associated with with dying. They all of a sudden just did not have fear of dying. They were like, "Yeah, this is fine. Whatever happens, happens." Amazing. So there are, obviously are. Uh, psychological effects, psychedelic effects. That's what it is. It's a psychedelic. Um, and can those be beneficial in certain circumstances at certain doses and, you know, for certain people? Yeah. You know, it does look like it's, it's becoming more and more like that, but again, it's a medicine, right? And so it can only be used in certain circumstances outside of those circumstances. It's, it's going to just give the harm and the, and that, that harm can be significant, right? So, um, it, it can be bad for your brain, absolutely. But in certain circumstances, it, it could be beneficial as well. I'm not, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, so that's not the sort of stuff that I'm I'm too well versed in. But I have seen peripherally there's there's a growing body of information about using psilocybin for for treatment of these things. And it seems very promising. Um, brain damage, PTSD, and depression all improve on a carnivore diet and even a ketogenic diet all of them, right? Or can at least. And, uh, you know, there are studies with brain damage, specifically with TBI, traumatic brain injuries and ketogenic diets, your brain heals better. You're getting more ketones to your brain that helps heal your brain. Ketones cross the blood brain barrier. First of all, it gives you better energy for your brain that, you know, works better with that, but also the ketones reconstitute into fatty acids. And those actually make up the physical structures of your brain. And you need more fatty meat, you're getting more cholesterol, you're improving your hormones and 20% of your brain is cholesterol. This is all going to help is going to help depression as well and PTSD. Um, you know, Professor Chris Palmer from Harvard, he's he's treating people with PTSD and depression and even uh, schizophrenia with ketogenic metabolic therapy. So addressing you know ketogenic diet, carnivore diet, addressing the metabolism, the mitochondrial health from a dietary standpoint, and also other interventions to help with uh, mitochondrial uh, function and metabolism as well. So. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that that has helped, uh, that has helped you. That's, that's awesome. You know, continue with the carnivore diet. I think that's going to help you a, a lot as well. Um, and then work with your, your doctor, um, if they think that, you know, uh, other things would, would help as well. Uh, interesting giraffe. Thank you for, for the super chat thoughts on detoxifying from, uh, the spike protein. Um, so yeah, I think, I'm trying to think of the of the name of the website, but there was a website that that did go into that and to talk about a different like a protocol on how to you know sort of sort of help with that um, and get that stuff sort of out of your system. I you know I do know that I, I you know I've spoken to some people with like long COVID and things like that, and they've they've seen they've improved with a carnivore diet, and so that's great. You know, it's great to see people you know, getting better, uh, in that regard as well. Um, I don't, I don't know that specific protocol for, for detoxifying from that though. Um, but that, but I do know that the, that people have put things out there on the internet and on different websites and things like that. So hopefully you can sort of just Google around and see if you can find a protocol, uh, for detoxifying from that. I wouldn't take any sort of crazy weird medications or, um, you know, if it's a medication, that's one thing you can look up the, the risk profile and, and side effect profile. But if it's like some weird herbal, this or that and the other, I'd, I'd probably stay away from it. Um, especially if it's not something you've sort of heard of before. Um, just because you have more, more side effects than others. I would definitely try a carnivore diet and just do that and let your body hopefully heal and just give, give time to, to heal. But, um, there are some protocols from actual uh, doctors and, and researchers and things like that, that, um, that I would, I would trust a bit more than just any, any random blog on the internet. Uh, so, you know, check the sources, make sure it's from someone that you, you trust and make sure it's not something that you look at that. And there's something that I look at that I'm not, I'm not putting that in my body. You know, I'm just not, I'm not doing that, you know, so, uh, take everything you read with a grain of salt. Unfortunately, I don't know a good detoxing method other than just eating a proper diet and, uh, time and letting your body heal. 
Uh, super chat from Paul. Thank you very much. A channel called Vegan Police uh, issued a challenge for carnivore to show uh, creatinine levels below uh, 0.7 and EGFR above 110 or 120. Um, that's hilarious. I mean, you know, your, your EGFR, you know, you get, um, it just says uh, like, depending on where you are, it's just like above 90. That's it. You know, so it's not going to, it's not going to say what it is after that. Um, people's, people's kidney functions improve, uh, creating levels. I mean, Jesus Christ. Let me see if I have my, I don't think I have my bloods here. Um, I have them anyway. It took them like three years ago. Uh, yeah, you, you create that. I mean, that's, that's, um, that's very funny, but the, uh, your creatinine levels are going to be low. You just drink water. Urea is going to be up, but creatinine will be low. And your EGFR, people's EGFR improve on a carnivore diet. And so they always go into to optimal ranges eventually. And, um, you know, so, uh, yeah. So I have no idea who that person is. I mean, the thing is, too, is that, you know, you, you, you issue these challenges. A vegan issues a challenge on a vegan website that vegans watch. And that's who's going to watch it. So, you know, I mean, I've never heard of this. So that's, that's, uh, that's good. You know, I'll, I'll make a note of that and, um, you know, I'll see if I can find my, my bloods and, uh, and show that, but you know, your EGFR, you know, generally just shows above 90 and that's it. It doesn't, it doesn't show anything else. Um, and so as long as it's above that, you know, the lab doesn't care. And so that, that might be a bit of a, um, of a uh, uh, of a, a loaded question, he said, "Oh, you have to show it above that." It's like, well, but the lab tests don't show it above that. Oh, so you can't show it? Okay, you you got me, uh, you got me, vegan police, you know. And so, uh, but no, people's people's kidney function improve, the creatinine will improve, uh, the EGFR improve. I've seen people in, in stage four renal failure improve quickly you know, and go completely out of kidney failure and go to EGFR above 90, you know, within three, four months, you know? And so, uh, you know, and that means creatinine is coming down. Right. And, uh, so, so no, that's very silly, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's funny though. I'll, I'll write a note of that. And, um, See if we can put it together. You know, sometimes though, it's just it's almost not even worth responding to these guys because you're just you're just giving them her time, you know, and you're just sort of you're just sort of giving them. Uh, you're, you're just making you're making people more aware of them, and that's really what they want. They want they want they want more people talking about them, and they want more people you know noticing them. So they just they just act like buffoons, and um, and uh, you know, and, and to try and attract attention. They don't, they don't care if it's good attention or bad attention. They just want attention, um, you know, for whatever reason. And, uh, so sometimes it's just like, well, why, why give it to them? You know, just do your own thing and, uh, and keep doing, doing what you you know, to be right and, and, uh, follow the evidence and go on from there. Uh, Daniel Finelli, thank you very much for the super chat. How would carnivore affect someone with high cholesterol? Also, I've been told garlic is good for the heart. Would you still recommend eating garlic or is it unnecessary? Thanks for your help. Uh, I don't think garlic's necessary. Um, you know, I, I've actually never heard it was good for your heart. You know, maybe some people have said it was, but in comparison to what? Um, I don't know. You know, you always have to ask that. You always have to ask, you know, compared to what? So I've got a rabid cat here just attacking my leg. And um, and uh, so someone with high cholesterol, well, you know, you, you, it depends on, on, on the cholesterol, right? So you're going to have a, you know, total cholesterol is, is not really a helpful metric to look at. So that being high or low is actually low is worse. Um, and, uh, but you know, your cholesterol will change. Your HDL will go up. Your triglycerides will go down. Your LDL will go up or down or stay the same. You know, a lot of people do different things. People with familial hypercholesterolemia, um, they have a slightly increased risk of, of heart disease and heart attack and stroke and things like that. Um, but only up until about the fifth decade, then it evens out and it becomes pretty much normal. And by the seventh decade, so people in their 70s actually have lower risk of heart disease and heart attacks and, and strokes with familial hypercholesterolemia. And, um, and so, you know, why is that, right? When I mean, they're just having high cholesterol the whole time, if that cholesterol is just, just the problem, then then it should be a problem all the time, right? Uh, but it's not. 
And so it, it, it appears that people with, with that also have an increased likelihood of having a genetic issue that causes them to clot more, you know, more clotting, more heart attacks, more strokes. Right. And, um, and so when you separate that out of those people with familial hypercholesterolemia from the ones that have clotting risk, increased clotting risk and ones who just have the high cholesterol, the ones that just have the high cholesterol, but no cl increased clotting risk, no increased risk of heart disease, heart attacks, strokes versus the rest of the population. That's important to know about. So I, I would still do exactly the same thing. Whatever your cholesterol is, whatever your genetic um, you know, idiosyncrasies are, you're still a human. And as a human, you will still have an optimal human diet, a biologically appropriate species specific diet that we all share, right? Because you will never find two examples, two, two members of the same species that have different optimal diets, right? It just doesn't happen. You know, lions eat what lions eat, penguins eat what penguins eat, you know, if they're the same kind of penguin, especially, you know, and, and different lizards and snakes and all these things, polar bears, pandas, uh, koalas and whales, they eat what their, what their species eat. Right. And what is optimal for, you know, that species is optimal for all members of that species. Right. Now there could be members of our species because we have agriculture and exposure to different sorts of things culturally that we have different defenses towards different plant toxins that other people do, but that doesn't make those plant toxins good for one person. It just means it's less bad for that person or those people. So that's, that's what I would, uh, I would always remember. Okay. So getting, getting towards the end of the super chat, been going for three hours and a half. That's a, that's a new record. <laughs> and see some of the numbers dropping off. So people are, are, are getting tired and bored and falling asleep. So <laughs> maybe we'll, we'll, we'll finish these up and then, uh, we'll call it a, call it a day. Um, super chat from solar flare. Um, thank you for that. One last question. Are there supplements that one really needs to be taking if they're only eating steak, eggs, and butter? I hear conflicting information from other influencers. Uh, no, generally not. Most people won't. If you're eating what you are supposed to eat, if you're eating what you're biologically designed to eat, then that's by definition, everything you need, right? So animals in the wild eating their natural diet, don't need supplements. If you need to take supplements, then by definition, your diet is deficient for whatever reason. Now, some people can be deficient on a carnivore diet because some of the meat that they're eating is not as nutrient dense as maybe other meat like regeneratively raised grass fed and finished cows or eggs or these sorts of things. An example of that, a regeneratively raised chicken egg versus a normal, you know, corn soy fed chicken egg, right? So the normal eggs that, that go out through America, about 41 milligrams of folate on average, that's the published numbers. Uh, there's a farmer, a rancher, you know, that was giving a talk and he said that his eggs that were regeneratively raised, just eating bugs and insects and worms, right? Uh, that the folate content of his eggs were over a thousand milligrams, right? So this is like 25 times the amount of folate. That's, that's a big difference, right? So if you're eating that egg and you're eating beef that has four to five times the amount of micronutrients as, as uh, you know, grain finished beef, no, you don't, you don't need any, you don't need to take any supplements. Most people on grain finished beef don't need to take, I don't, I don't take any supplements. I don't take any multivitamins, anything like that. Um, I've checked my numbers. They're all in optimal ranges. That's what my body does. Most people's bodies will do that as well. Just with store-bought, you know, beef and lamb and chicken and fish, pork, whatever. Um, some people will be a little different, you know, again, referencing back to the MTHFR gene um, mutation, people can have a, an issue with folate and maybe we'll have lower folate. Some people will be symptomatic with that. Some people won't. I've, I've seen it both ways, but you might just need to eat a bit more liver, right? So that's the supplement. The only supplement you ever need is, is a bit of organs, bit of organs. You, you don't need a ton of these things. And remember that the organs are so nutrient dense that if you're only eating organs or you're eating predominantly or a large amount of organs, you're going to get, you're going to get, uh, uh, vitamin and mineral toxicity. 
Okay, so that's something that you can do, and that, that can really disrupt your hormones. Hypervitaminosis A is known to suppress thyroid stimulating hormone, which will depress your thyroid, right? So if you're eating a ton of liver all the time and your vitamin A is getting a bit too high, you can actually suppress your thyroid, okay, and, uh, and do other things as well. So that's something you need to think about. That's something you need to remember. Remember that, you know, you take down a cow or a bison or a buffalo or something like that, big animal, that's going to have about two years worth of meat on it, right? It has one liver. So you're gonna have hundreds of pounds of skeletal muscle meat and fat to every you know one pound of uh, of of liver, right? So just I, I would keep that in proportion, especially if you're eating the regeneratively raised stuff. Dear God, that stuff's gonna be it's just like rocket fuel. But um, but but that's the long and short of it. Most people don't need to take any supplements, um, and especially if, if you're eating a bit of liver, then definitely no. That is a supplement. That is the supplements. You should definitely get all the nutrients you need from what you are eating. If you have to take supplements, you know you're either coming from a very deficient state, which most people are, and it's going to take time to catch up, or you know, or it's it's just a bit more deficient than you need. You need something else uh, on top of that. Like, like some liver. So I would just check that. Um, add in a bit of liver once or twice a week, small amounts, don't, don't do huge uh, overboard sort of thing. Check your levels, check your vitamins, check your minerals, check your B12, your folate, your magnesium, your zinc, your vitamin D, and uh, you know whatever else you wanna check, make sure you're in, in optimal levels, right? There are other things that affect these things as well. Um, but obviously, you know, diet is, is a major factor there. So uh, just, uh, you know, eat meat, drink water, have a bit of liver a couple times a week. If you're, especially if you're coming from a you know standard diet, um, this is going to be nutrient deficient. A vegan, vegetarian, plant-based diet definitely going to be deficient. And um, and then in sort of three months or so, check your levels, see where you're at. Check them now, check them then, see the trend, right? And then add a bit more liver in if you need it. And uh, Scar and Thor's mom, uh, thank you very much for the super sticker. I really appreciate it. And coming up to the to, to the last uh, super chat here, uh, evil is real. Thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate it. Keto to ketovore to carnivore. 270 pounds to 230 pounds to 210 pounds. Fantastic. I still eat double cream live culture cottage cheese for a gut biome. Seems good for me. Your thoughts? I think that's fine. Um, you know, it's not going to have really much of any carbs, if any. Um, one thing that that Dr. Sean Amara, who's who's looked into this a lot, um, has has pointed out that you want to you want to eat that with the meat, right? So you want to get those bacteria, you want to chew those up in the food, right? And uh, and and in the meat and swallow that, right? And um, and uh, and so that that can be. That can be beneficial uh, to do it that way, and as opposed to just eating it on its own. You know, I don't know if this sort of mixes it up and sort of protects the bacteria enough so that some of it survive to get down to the part of your your gut that it can actually live and um, and provide benefit. But that seems to be what what he recommends. Also, you know, um, you know, I've I've heard I can't remember if it was him or or someone else who was saying that you know your 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 oral biome, you have a lot of different bacteria. You want to put in more beneficial bacteria in with what you're eating because you're putting in bacteria from your mouth in there as well. And, uh, you know, we talk about like fight bites, you know, the, the, the bacteria from human mouth is actually very aggressive. Uh, so actually like a dog bite is, um, uh, can be less of a dangerous infection than, than a, uh, a human bite or, uh, you know, if you punch someone and you, cut your hand on their tooth or something like that. It's called a fight bite. And that's, um, and that can give you quite a bad infection, but, um, your oral biome will change as well. And so if you're not eating carbohydrates, you're not eating anything else, you, you will have a different oral biome. And, and you guys can look at, uh, Dr. Kevin stock, who's a, who's a really good guy. I've become friendly with him over the years and, um, he's a dentist and he talks a lot about, about oral health, or oral biome as well, uh, your oral biome is going to change, right? And so, you know, what you eat, your bacteria eat, right? And so you're going to, um, you know, if you're, if you're eating carbs and sugar and these sorts of things, you're going to have different bacteria in your mouth. And most people are eating carbs and all these sorts of things. So the bacteria that you're going to get from that fight bite is going to be different from, uh, you know, someone eating a standard diet 
as opposed to someone eating a carnivore diet. And so presumably you're going to have different bacteria. Uh, well, you are going to have different bacteria in your mouth. And, um, and as a result, you're going to have different bacteria uh, that gets into the food and goes down into your into your intestine as well. So it could very well be that you have, you know, healthy things that are then going to seed down and be okay as well. But that's the idea is, um, you know, eating, even eating those ferments with, uh, with your food. And then that gets down and can help your, your gut biome. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's, there's much of a problem with that. I think after a while you probably won't need to from a gut biome sense, you don't necessarily need to keep redoing that because the bacteria are there. You know, and so once you have a good complement of bacteria, um, then it's just eating the right things. We'll feed them, you know, and we'll feed them uh, and, and perpetuate them. And so, you know, like the Inuit, there's a um, study looking at the microbiome of, of the Inuit, you know, the, the traditional Inuit who only eat meat, very healthy, very diverse gut biome on a, on a meat only diet. They don't have ferments, right? Um, maybe sometime, but I, I don't think they really do, do much because they don't, they don't, they're, they're hunting. They're not herding and milking right and so you know maybe they have some sort of fermented stuff but uh uh by and large it's just eating meat and so i don't think you need to continue that and perpetuate that anyway so but it's but it's up to you i don't think there's any any problem with it as long as you you don't have a problem with dairy some people have problems with dairy uh it is going to be a bit more the casein can be a bit pro-inflammatory people can have problems with it and so it may be that you know getting rid of that completely you know uh makes you feel even better maybe but if you feel fine with it and and you enjoy it you know then that i don't think there's any problem with it anyway Okay, so uh, just another super chat from from Paul. I want to say thank you for your channel and advice. I've been doing carnivore for about 1.5 months and have lost 47 pounds. Awesome. I'm finally under 400. Thank you. Hey, that's great, Paul. That's really awesome. Well, well done. Uh, I mean, you're doing you're the one doing the work, man. So you know, that's uh, congratulations to you. That's a really great job. You're doing great. Keep going. Your body's just going to keep losing weight. You know, losing weight early on is a good sign that you're going to keep losing weight in a, in a consistent manner some people lose a bit of weight and then they stall or some people don't lose much weight at all very rare but it does happen and they just they need to you know they need their bodies need to heal and their and their hormones need to heal and normalize a bit um uh you know a bit uh for you know until they'll you know before they'll they'll start losing a lot of weight and a lot of fat in particular and, uh, you know, especially for people that are working out, just remember that if you're lifting weights and you're you know running, sprinting, very good for your health, very good uh, to stimulate fat loss and to stimulate uh, proper hormonal functioning. But also remember that you're going to put on muscle as well. And then that can offset the amount of weight that you're losing. So you'd be losing fat, but you're also be putting on muscle and, and you're putting on bone density as well. So you're going to be gaining weight from that standpoint. You're going to be losing weight from a fat standpoint. So don't be surprised if that slows down a bit or even stalls. Remember, I lost 23 pounds in 10 days, just dropping just, just, just stopping vegetables and eating a lot more meat. Probably quintupled the amount of calories that I was eating and I lost 23 pounds in 10 days. So there goes the idea of calories in, calories out, um, which is a nonsensical idea in the first place. That's someone who hasn't studied or paid attention to biochemistry. That's... These chemicals are very different and they have chemical reactions in your bodies that are very different, hormonal re reactions and responses that are very different. You cannot boil them down to how much energy is released when you burn them because we don't burn them. We are not a combustion engine. We're, we're a, a, a chemical factory. So that that uh, is uh, nonsensical, really, when you when you examine it. Um, it's just it's just been repeated again and again and again and again at the highest levels of, of uh, academia. You know, and so you have a lot of you know, PhDs and MDs and all these sorts of things. Oh yeah, calories in, calories out. Oh god, no. no. That's just like the the higher protein causes kidney function thing, uh, dysfunction. You know that that's a that's a myth that just needs to die because it's just uh, uh, it's wrong. It's just wrong. But um, but yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Paul. I really appreciate that, and thank you very much, everyone, uh, for uh, for everything. Um, 
and, uh, and and for joining. I, I just sort of just saw this one last thing. Uh, <laughs> this is a question from Dawn. Uh, is fatty liver with some infiltration the same as what uh, liver cirrhosis? No, liver cirrhosis is, is uh, scarring. So that's permanent damage and destruction of the liver. And um, I, I, you know, I don't, some infiltration, you know, I, I don't look at sort of liver scans and things like that, but uh, you know, maybe they're talking about like a, a bit of scarring, but generally they're, they're, you know, they're, they're pretty clear on that with some areas of cirrhosis and so on. Cirrhosis is just scarring as so that's permanent damage to the liver uh, in that area. And that uh, that's really not going to come back. Fatty liver, you can reverse cirrhosis. You really can't, but you can optimize, um, you can optimize, uh, you know, the rest of your liver as well. So there's one more sort of super chat. Um, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm going to try to close off after this. So, so please don't throw any more super chats in, uh, because I, I will feel obligated to answer them, but you really probably should close off, sign off, uh, digestive enzymes for poor digestion. Um, well, it, it depends on what you mean by, by poor digestion, but, um, you know, if you, if you actually have pancreatic insufficiency, uh, then you, you might need to take some, some digestive enzymes, uh, to make up for that, but most people don't need to do that most people will do just fine um and if you you know wanted to sort of take that early on and you found that 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 was helpful you know sure go for it um most people won't be in that situation there are going to be some people that maybe have pancreatic insufficiency but you know that should heal generally it depends on what's causing it so um it depends if you actually have pancreatic insufficiency yes digestive enzymes are a good idea um and you know most people will do just fine without them though um and uh, when you're getting rid of these anti-nutrients and these digestive disruptors that are in plants, people people's digestion seems to do better. Maybe it can maybe take a few days for your body to really get used to eating more meat and more fat, and or a few weeks or whatever, but it will, and uh, and that should be fine. So, okay, thank you very much, everyone. I really appreciate that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alan, for the super sticker. I appreciate that. Um, well, let me know what you guys think. You know, it's really kind of you guys to be in here. I love the chats. I love how everyone's uh, talking to each other and helping each other out in there as well, which is which is fantastic. Um, um, and uh, and I really appreciate that. I'll just hit this one last one uh, from Cool Burn. Uh, do you recommend a person from alcoholic cirrhosis to go straight carnivore or fast for a few days first? No, I don't think you need to fast first. I think you can go straight into a carnivore diet. Um, Obviously, if you have if you have alcoholic withdrawals and things like that, that's something that needs to be medically managed. But the cirrhosis side of things, no, you can just go straight into it. You don't need to fast. I, I think the the vast majority of the benefit that comes from fasting is again just not eating the wrong things, and that's what you'll get on a carnivore diet. You're not eating the wrong things. You're only eating things that provide uh, you know good nutrition to your body. You're not getting anything else, and uh, and you get the same benefits. There's a lot of studies looking at fasting mimicking diet so-called which is just a ketogenic diet and they find that they have not only the same benefits but uh, in fact more benefits of um uh, from a ketogenic diet uh, because you're actually getting nutrition as opposed to um you know just not eating stupid things so uh yeah all right thank you everyone you know uh please you know like and subscribe if you haven't already share this with people that you think would be helpful if anyone could help me out with uh some time stamps and things like that that would be really helpful Okay. All right. So sorry, there's was, there was a bit of a, of a power glitch. Uh, I don't know what that was about, but I think that's probably the universe telling me to, to wrap it up. So uh, thanks everyone. Really appreciate that. Um, and, uh, you know, just, just, yeah, if someone can help with the, with the, the timestamps and things like that with the questions, that would be really helpful. Um, and, um, and, uh, you know, just leave a comment, see what you think, you know, and ask more questions in the comments. I do try to answer them if I can, uh, but it also gives me more things to, to, uh, address the next live. And I'll try to do these every week, next week, um, Friday, 
uh, or you know, Friday my time, Thursday U.S. time. Um, I'll try to do the same time, but I, I, I may be traveling, so I'll be flying over to that conference. So I may just change the time. I may have to do it later in the evening on Friday, and uh, which would be Friday morning for people in America. Um, and then the UK people can, might be able to get involved as well. But I'll, I'll, I'll see exactly what my travel schedule is like and uh, and let you guys know and put out an announcement on YouTube as well as on Instagram and Facebook and things like that. And um, and uh, um, and then uh, tomorrow I'm doing same time, same start time, doing a group uh, group Q and A sort of thing with uh, you know uh, Sean White and Pip and um, and Dave Mack and things like that that we're doing on the sort of Friday Saturday thing as well. So if people are around for that, uh, come down and that that's been announced on my YouTube channel as well. So, all right, guys, um, thanks a lot for everything and I will see you next time. Hope you have a great rest of your week.